My teacher wouldn't let me use the bathroom during a test. So I peed on her carpet. The title makes me sound like some super cool rebel engaging in some sweet malicious compliance. No. In fact, I was a shy little beanpole struggling with undiagnosed ADHD and a bladder condition. In seventh grade, my English teacher had a rule that if you didn't bring back your book, you couldn't take bathroom breaks. Let's ignore that having access to the bathroom is a right and not a privilege, okay? I was always a forgetful child. I've lost pencils, stuffed animals, jackets, glasses, and much more from a very young age. At the same time, I was also a kid who would wet their pants and bed all the time. Neither of these issues were properly addressed or diagnosed until I was in my 20s. Still don't really know what the bladder thing is at 28 years old. Needless to say, I did not do a great job of bringing my book in. During a test, I had the strong urge to go to the bathroom. At that point in time, my urges were accompanied by a leak that made it through to my pants and did not leave a lot of time to hold it. I walked over to her desk, keeping my skinny little thighs pressed together to hide the wet stain. When I asked to go to the bathroom, I was given a firm no. Now, I was a kid that followed rules religiously and was uncomfortable speaking up against authority figures, so I waddled back to my seat and tried to finish my test. There was a lot of squirming, thigh squeezing, hand pressing, and grimacing, but none of it stopped the inevitable. Not only did I massively wet my pants, but it filled the empty space of the plastic seat and dripped into a puddle that soaked into the carpet. I thank whatever deity is out there that there wasn't tile. The people around me would definitely have been able to hear it happen, and I probably would have burst out into some very ugly crying. Holding back tears, I raised a trembling hand and had to whisper that I had an accident. Her attitude did a complete 180 degree backflip. She started fumbling her words as she worked out a plan. I would hold on to my test at my desk and wait until the bell rang. The classroom would be empty for about 30 to 45 seconds between the English class walking out and her study hall kids walking in so she could call my 8th period teacher and explain that I wouldn't be there. She would have the kid whose chair I drenched sit in a different seat and I'd be able to ride it out until school was over. I sat through a silent study hall with a book planted in front of me while I battled the tears I wanted to cry. When it finally ended, she scurried off to my locker with my combination on a sticky note and came back with my gym clothes. She then stood guard outside the narrow window alongside the door while I changed. A janitor arrived before I left, so I had two people to shakily apologize to with very wet eyes. My mum told me that my teacher contacted her with some very emotional apologies and many promises to let me use the bathroom whenever I needed to. She apologized to me as well and generally was much kinder. She'd previously been pretty cold because of the aforementioned forgetfulness. At the time, this event didn't feel like a traumatized them back moment. I didn't start owning the issues I dealt with until my mid-twenties and now I actively embrace them. I'm very open with my partner about when I'm having particular symptoms and have advocated for myself medically to find solutions, admittedly only partial ones. It's horribly sad to think about how much I let embarrassment and shame dictate my life. It kept me from having sleepovers, made me miss field trips and contributed significantly to my social anxiety. Looking back on this negative experience, however, makes me feel a bit satisfied that the person who actually should be ashamed, i.e. the person who disregarded someone else's needs, was clearly traumatized to a degree. And I certainly don't let people make me feel ashamed of my limitations anymore. Wow, you know what? Controversial opinion here, but I reckon that this teacher is actually a nice person, just from the way she reacted to this. Now, I know a lot of you are not going to agree with that, but that is genuinely what I'm getting from this. If she she felt like she had to apologize to save her job, I don't think she would have apologized to UOP either. Yes, I understand that in the moment, she probably thought that she had to apologize to OP's parents in case they took it up higher, you know, went to the headmaster, whatever, or headmistress, whatever. But I feel like she genuinely was really sorry that this happened and really ashamed. And I feel like she now probably won't do this again. And I also feel like, you know, there are kids in school that do very often just forget their books or just don't bring them in on purpose. And she probably had come to this sort of solution as a way that, that may well have worked in the past, you know, forcing kids to bring their books in as they're supposed to, or they can't go to the bathroom. Now, is it like right? No, clearly not. But maybe it, it worked in the past to, to stop kids that were just trying to get out of, of working or learning. However, yeah, I don't know. You comment down below, guys. What do you reckon? Do you think I'm being a bit too naive here? And she just got caught out and was covering her own back? I actually genuinely think, just from the way OP's described it, that she has been traumatized by this, 
because she actually is a decent person she just didn't realize how badly she got this wrong now does this take away from the fact that this is a horrible thing to go through and would obviously cause trauma for op no i'm not saying that for one second so whatever my sort of interpretation of the facts is the fact is this was still a terribly traumatic thing that op went through but i don't know that was just my overarching feeling let me know if you agree i mean no doubt about it she has to just learn or hopefully she did learn from this that she needs to have more compassion to her students no matter what because yeah treating the bathroom as like a privilege is a really terrible thing to do as a teacher so i'm not saying that that's not but yeah interested to hear your thoughts i don't think that a lot of you are going to agree with me but that's what it's all about baby get your comments in down below sorry i know i'm rambling here but i remember in my schooling in primary and secondary school so both which is you know from the age of four maybe not in primary i mean i don't remember fully in early primary school but say from the age of like roughly nine to 18 or at least 16 we weren't allowed to go to to the toilet during class very often at all only if you really really insisted that you had to go would you be allowed and sometimes you wouldn't be allowed they would the teacher would just say to hold it now as we saw the story the other day it is different and it should always be different if you do have a medical condition however in this situation you didn't explicitly say you had one because you didn't know and you were ashamed of it etc so you know that's a little bit up in the air and that that, that is just a, a real shame for you but i remember in my schooling career not being allowed to go to the toilet that was like a, a school rule and they just said you need to go between periods that was it so again was that a bad thing is was my school bad no it was it was very good so I don't know. Again, <laughs> I want to hear your thoughts. Get them in. Let's end this episode now. Get your comments in down below. Want to accuse me of stealing? I'll make you look bad too. On Thursday, I found out I likely have thyroid cancer. While pretty treatable, and I'm sure I'll be fine, I've already survived cancer twice, and hearing that word again has been difficult, to say the least. After my terrible day, I decided to go to a local gas station and buy a trashy pizza and some snacks to hang out in the local park. I had to use the bathroom, waiting for the woman who was in the bathroom. Immediately after I closed the door, she started yelling at me through the door that she'd left her dollar. It took me a second to realize she was talking to me, but when I did, I yelled back to her that I didn't see it, but I'd be out in a minute. I finished up my business, and honestly, I'd planned to just give her the dollar if she couldn't find it, as I just happened to have a dollar on me. I don't usually carry cash, and she seemed somewhat frantic, like she needed it for a purchase. That was until she came out and started yelling at me that I stole her dollar, and how dare I steal a dollar from a homeless person. Honestly, thinking it was probably a scam, I didn't have the energy to deal with her, and I thought it was best to not interact. She continued to yell for a few minutes before huffing and puffing to the front. Someone helped her purchase whatever item it was she wanted as she talked trash about me to everyone there. As she was leaving, she turned back to me. I was now waiting in line and started yelling. You're seriously going to steal from a homeless woman? Honestly, she seemed in a kind of rough place, so I probably shouldn't have and I definitely wouldn't have usually, but I was at the end of my rope. So I snapped back, looking her dead in the eyes and replied, and you're going to harass a woman with cancer over something she didn't do? Everyone got really silent after that, and she puffed out. Yeah, I might be a bit of a jerk for that one, but honestly, it felt good for a sec. No, you're not the jerk here at all, OP, in my opinion. I think you're, you're, you're completely within your, your bounds to, to say something like this. You know, if you're getting abused by some, like, rando, and they're accusing you of stuff that you haven't done, you can do it back to them when it's actually legit. It is. So, yeah, respect. And um, well done for not letting her just get away with this and not giving her a dollar. I mean, I don't really know what her intentions were. It, it does seem as though it might have been a scam. Who really knows? Just a confusing situation all around, but I think you dealt with it perfectly fine. That's the thing. Like, if nobody pulls her up on this, then she's never going to learn to be self-aware, right? And it takes someone like you saying something like that to hopefully make her change her ways and not do this thing anymore i don't really know what it is so yeah good on you do it more i say i've been calling my sister by her full given name when she dead names my niece my brother's kid who is a 22 year old woman came out as trans on her 21st birthday about a year ago and changed her name from lance to lacy most of our family accepted it and the ones who didn't weren't close anyway except our sister Eva, who is 45. We are a Native American family with a lot of creative names, and my sister's birth name is something close to Evangeline, but she decided to go by Eva after a white kid said her name was Rezzed Out. 
i.e. a low-class or stereotypical name from an Indian reservation. She's insisted on Eva for about 35 years and we all obliged. Now, she's regularly been calling my trans niece by her dead name Lance since she came out as trans. So I started calling her Evangeline, which she hates. The whole family caught on and have only been referring to her as Evangeline for about a year now and she is furious every time she comes to family events. Recently, she's been calling me by my full first name to bother me. My first name is a portmanteau hyphenation of my mum's four sisters' names. Something like Alexiana Dorothyke, but wackier, wow. People have always called me AD or Lexi, or my brothers called me Dodo since he was a kid. I love my full first names, but it's cumbersome to use an eight-syllable name regularly. Well, my full name caught on with family and friends. Just despite Evangeline, we have all reverted back to our full names instead of nicknames. Our dad is no longer Frank, he's Franklin. Our mum no longer Roz, she is Rosalind. Brother no longer Nate, he's Nathaniel. My sister-in-law is no longer Kate, she's Catherine, etc. This has truly driven Evangeline away, which was the plan in the first place. Lacey makes for better company, so good riddance to one trashy sister. You know what? I just despise people like this. Coming out as trans is probably one of the most courageous things you can possibly do, and it must be an extremely difficult thing for somebody to do, made even worse by people like this, who just don't accept it clearly at all, and still sadly use their dead name to probably make them question whether they even should have come out in the first place. I mean, the only thing that Lacey can do is just ignore Eva as much as she can. And I think to be fair, OP, with your help and the rest of the families, she has been able to do this. But it's just so ignorant, right? Eva knows what she's doing here. There's no doubt about it. The fact of the matter is, she clearly has an issue that Lacey's name has changed, but then she didn't have an issue calling other family members by their nicknames. Ugh, just a disgraceful person. I hope you disown her. Right, let's step things up a bit. Our next story is some phenomenal escalating revenge. Should have just let me walk away with my share. All you had to do was let me walk away. For some background, I am a practicing internal medicine physician and formerly a 50% owner in what was once a fairly successful med spa with four locations at least until what happened below. Before anyone accuses me of breaking the law, blah, 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 don't. This has been litigated, resolved, and I won. But it is a fun story. In the beginning, my business partner and I were mere acquaintances working with a large hospitalist practice. Looking for extra income to pay off student loans, we decided to band together and open a med spa offering Botox, minor cosmetic procedures, B12 infusions, etc. And it was a huge hit, big enough for us to go full time and expand. This lasted around seven years. Beginnings of problems. My partner decides that his wife isn't enough for him and begins to step out on her. Now, this is none of my business. However, it does become my business when you embezzle money to pay for your sugar baby's gifts from our business account. Fast forward a few years and I've sat on this information because business overall was too good to walk away from. However, COVID changed things and we had to close two of our four locations. My partner has never been great with money or time management, which is why for the most part, I handled all of the back office stuff from ordering supplies to billing and payroll and so on. This comes into play later. Around six months ago, I began looking for a new position and found a new job. I didn't want to leave my partner in a hard spot, so I gave him a 90 day notice to find another partner or otherwise get his business affairs in order before I resigned. He instead used this time to siphon off more funds for his side piece and allow his unruly children to ransack my office while I was away on a family vacation and frequently not showing up to work or showing up late or super hungover, leaving me to do extra. So it was my time to go and my time to get even. Finally, the time had come to wind down my time. Per our agreement, my partner was to buy out my 50% of the practice, which we agreed would occur on the Monday of my last week. Basically, I'd take 50% of our liquid assets as a bank transfer. Monday, upon checking the bank account, I'd been locked out. And upon regaining access, I found that $30,000 of my half had been moved to an account I did not have access to. I had had it, and I spent the next few days plotting my revenge. Remember those back office things that I handled above? Well, all of those documents, processes, order forms, etc., they're all shared on our shared office hard drive and are absolutely vital to the practice and are way too much work for my partner to do himself in a short time. 
I just so happened to buy an identical model and take the original hard drive home with me. Upon plugging the hard drive in, I found a backup of his calendar, pictures and emails between him and his mistress, which I forwarded to his wife. The following day, I ran a full page ad in the local paper announcing a special holiday deal on our services, which we'd planned. Lastly, I hired some college students to write a slew of bad reviews on Google and Yelp to tank the overall ratings. The aftermath. The week after my departure, the clinic was insanely busy and quickly ran out of supplies. Since the order forms, etc. were gone, he had to turn away new and long-standing clients. My partner sued for the documents and I countersued for the $30,000 he owed me. We settled by exchanging the two. I've since heard that his wife divorced him, his mistress left him, and subsequently, he has filed for bankruptcy as the clinic never recovered and his wife cleaned him out. I, on the other hand, really like my new job. Well, this is an absolute masterpiece. And yeah, he deserves it. He absolutely deserves the destruction that you've put upon him and the fact that probably his life is pretty ruined right now. It's just weird because your lives were going so well. Your relationship was so good, right? As business partners and you were growing this great business. Even through COVID, managing to keep half of your sites open as a new business is extremely impressive. I mean, most businesses definitely would have just completely gone under there, but you managed to keep two out of four locations open. But no, apparently that wasn't enough. I've got to embezzle loads of money to pay off my my new women that I'm chasing and then some other stuff as well. You know, even your partner who you've grown this business with, you're willing to just hide money from, take money away from them. Yeah, disgusting. And once again, very, very deserve revenge. Okay, then let's step things up once again. Now it's time for some serious stuff. This is r slash pro revenge. Do not scheme people and talk about it in another language they might understand it. I am a Serbian who moved to America to work for four years. I was in a smaller IT company, around 20 people, and I was highly regarded by the owners. There were two of them. Sometimes I represented them in meetings, mostly when showcasing the company's services and so on. One day while on a break, I overheard one of the owners mentioning they had a meeting with a Serbian company and they would like me to accompany them in case there were any communication issues. I agreed. During the meeting, we forgot to mention that I was Serbian. I was introduced as an assistant, so I didn't feel the need to introduce myself. When we presented our services, they started speaking in Stravakai. Apologies if I've pronounced that wrong. A Serbian slang where words are twisted, probably thinking that if anyone had learned Serbian, they wouldn't be able to understand them. I understood every word. They were attempting to deceive the company and it was evident we weren't their first or last target. I wrote down a few things they said, translated them and showed one of the owners the translation. After the meeting, they asked if I was sure and I confirmed. Due to some procedures, we had to meet one more time. But with permission, I said, Raz milisemo o vasem predlogu, which by the way, translates as we will think about your proposal. They just froze for a second. Face white and open mouthed, they looked at each other and tried to stay cool. But you could hear in their voices, they knew they screwed up. We didn't sign anything with that company. I don't know how many times over the course of my channel's history, I've seen stories similar to this. I don't know what it is with idiotic people that just don't think that other people could potentially speak their language. Like surely the fact that you are speaking your language in the country you're in tells you that there could be other people in the country you're in also speaking the same language. I mean, why even risk this? Why try and talk behind people's backs who you're trying to get money off or, you know, do business with in a situation like this? If you're going to try and scheme someone and probably don't do it, but if you're going to try, probably don't speak about scheming them to their face. Just insane. Ultimately, they've lost a lot of money. And yes, what they were doing was terrible anyway, but they could have at least made some money from it. So. For them, personally, their idiotic screw-up just cost them tens of thousands of dollars, probably. What I do hope is that you got a big pay rise, or at least a promotion, because you've saved the company. Now, we don't know how much money it was, but you've saved the company probably a heck of a lot of money just from this one thing and being in that meeting. And also, sticking your neck out and, and telling your bosses, look, I know this is weird, but this is literally what's happening right now. I'm 100% confident on it. How much money might you have saved them? I mean, we have no idea. But yeah, I hope you got a bonus at least. Okay, now that is going to do it for the, let's be honest, sort of safe, gentle stuff off this episode. The next story is crazy. It comes from Nuclear Revenge. 
As you can see by the title and the thumbnail, it is just mental. And uh, yeah, I hope you're prepared for it. If you're not, then, then just be prepared. Now, before we get into it, I do just want to mention something. It's a bit of an announcement, actually. A lot of you have been commenting and you've seen over the past couple of weeks or so on my channel that I've been posting pretty much only stories that are based on relationship drama. Stories from r slash relationship advice, r slash relationship subreddits like that. And the reason for that is because I've just been loving those sort of posts and stories at the moment. They come from, you know, best of Redditor updates, that sort of stuff. So there's always conclusions. There's always a lot of drama, which I like, and you guys seem to be liking as well. And that is the reason why I'm covering a lot of them now. As you can see in this episode, we're back on, on a more normal standard subreddit for my channel, Pro Revenge and, and Revenge subreddits. But I am really enjoying the relationship stuff at the moment. So for that reason, I don't want to completely inundate you all with solely relationship drama content. So what I've done to appease myself and those of you that really like the drama stuff is I've made a new channel, Redditor Extra, where I'm going to be posting solely relationship drama stories, be that weddings, bridezillas, cheating, anything. I mean, you guys have seen over the past couple of weeks, these stories can have literally anything in them over on that channel. Now, I've already posted one entire video episode on that channel. And the reason why nobody has seen it yet, and I've not told anyone yet, is because I wanted to wait until, you know, quite a long time into a normal episode of mine to tell you guys still listening and watching right now, the core audience about the channel. It's a bit of a secret, okay? So I only want the people that are really fans of my stuff to go over there and enjoy the channel. You know, don't tell people about it. Keep it to yourself. I'll leave a link to it, not even in the description. It's just going to, you know, I'll leave it in the description, but a few lines down and I'll also put it on the end screen as well. But yeah, don't go talking about it loads in the comments. I just want this to be for the core fans. All right. With that being said, hopefully uh, people haven't heard that. But um, yeah, search for Redditor Extra or click the link at the end of this one. Now, let's get in to the fourth and final story of this episode. Make up rumors that I have CP and I'm a prostitute because I won't date you. Say goodbye to your new $150,000 car and hello prison and a ruined life. So first of all, let's introduce the characters. Me, an 18 year old male, unmedicated senior. Psycho incel, referred to as PI, a 16 year old boy. So for backstory, I was the only gay kid in what felt like my entire small deep south southern town and came out very young. So that identity kind of stuck. My family was mostly very supportive and I'm grateful for that because outside of two or three friends, I might as well have had a Scarlet A branded to my forehead. Eventually though, a few other people came out. One being Psycho Incel, a very wealthy, spoiled, all American entitled kid who drove a very, very expensive new car. Now, when he first came out, it was to no one's surprise, but regardless, a mutual friend was worried it would be a hard time and asked if I would befriend him and give him tips on how to get through it, etc. I, of course, said yes. Big mistake. Now, by this time, I didn't care what anyone thought because the people who mattered had already made it apparent and vice versa. So I was pretty open about the fact that I was actively dating someone much, much older than me. I don't want to hear it. That's not the point of the story. It was a wonderful, healthy relationship that my conservative, traditional dad even supported. So shut up. Fair enough. No comments from me. Not that I would comment anyway. Respect. Now, after getting coffee with Psycho Incel and being friendly, he apparently developed feelings for me. And after he confessed, I gently told him I was seeing someone and that I was very happy. This was common knowledge in our gossip-ridden high school anyhow. And that was apparently not acceptable to him and he went ballistic. In small towns, there are often what's known as junior-senior wars, where the two grades have a war of harmless, albeit annoying pranks. However, our school was not completely uncivilized, so there was a group chat for both grades to discuss rules, limits, such as no damaging, no hitting houses if someone expressed that they weren't participating, renting, etc. Well, in that group chat with over 1,000 kids, Psycho Incel thought it would be a great time to drop bombshell number one. I had expressed that I was not participating, to not hit my house as it's rented, and so on and so forth. Q Psycho Incel responding directly and saying, what, you can't afford to buy it with all the money you've been making being a prostitute for your 50 year old boyfriend? I would like to say first off, my boyfriend was nowhere near that age. I saw red. 
I love that man to death and felt a forehead vein practically hemorrhage. Safe to say the rumor passed through the high school and the community. My coaches took me aside. Our extra religious teachers tormented me more and I was a pariah. Oh well, I had acceptance to a top university, my friends, my boyfriend and my family. I was almost done. Then the next rumor dropped. And this is when I went nuclear. One day I got a call from my friend and immediately I knew something was wrong. Apparently, little psycho incel had decided it was a good idea to lie and tell people that I had one, cheated on my boyfriend, two, made a video with the guy I cheated with, three, it was with a junior, someone under 18, none of which was remotely true. Thankfully, he was very popular and very straight and was also an obsession of psycho incels and knew where it came from. And he agreed to, in writing, express that none of this was true and gave me copious amounts of evidence, screenshots of texts, Instagram DMs, etc., of psycho incels online harassment. I kept all of this in a file just in case this ever got out and I needed to defend myself. And thankfully, it never became more than a funny, impossible, salacious story made up about me. However, it was too late for him, as I was already very mentally unstable, and this would have ruined everything I was riding on. Now, on to the revenge, finally. So not only was Psycho Incel's car brand new, but it was a new car because he destroyed his old one and was not getting another. Love small town gossip, but also driving through someone's house is pretty conspicuous, lol. Now, I'll admit I did not come up with this. I read it in a fan fiction, but it actually worked out very well. The first thing I did was go to the furthest bait and tackle shop I could find, and I bought catfish bait. Now, if you don't fish, you might not know, but catfish love the stinkiest, smelliest bait you can find, and I bought a whole jar of the slop. I knew the parking lot of my school had no security or cameras because my car had already been vandalized. I did embrace the F word carved into my door with pride eventually. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. And then I got to work in the cold February morning. The first thing I did was hammer nails into three of his tires. Now, this wouldn't pop them immediately, but they would eventually each deflate at much more inconvenient places, and nails would look more accidental than if they were slashed. Then I took poison ivy and rubbed it all over the door handles of his car. Afterwards, I took a mix of gravel and Vaseline and spread it all over the windshield wipers, which would just scratch the heck out of it once he used them. My favorite, however, was using that catfish bait. Knowing enough about cars, i.e. copious googling, I figured out how to get to the AC portion and I poured in the catfish bait. Sadly, I wouldn't be able to witness this, but he wouldn't be using his AC for another month or so since it's still cold. All that time for it to rot, fester, congeal, and the first day it's warm and he decides to blast AC, his car will be filled with the fumes of a thousand rotten piles of roadkill and low tide without any idea where it's coming from or how to get rid of it. The next part of this story is honestly out of pure dumb luck, and I can't claim complete responsibility from the universe's work. However, I, being the obsessive paranoid type, would check his socials from a burner account now and again perhaps hoping to hear about his fishy car or to see if he aired out more rumors about me. One day, I found something odd. Nothing. Every single social media was gone. Out of pure curiosity, I googled his name and found something very juicy and very crazy. He was arrested in an entirely different state for attempting to impersonate a government official and bring a gun into a theme park. Safe to say that didn't fly, but also it did not get enough traction as I would like. Thus, I sent it to everyone I knew in our small town. His summer job, future college, our high school, that giant group chat of over a thousand people. Yeah, it got sent there as well. By the end of the day, he was a pariah, jobless and collegeless. I left my town and honestly, I haven't heard anything about him since. But I can't imagine he amounted to much being that insane and with that type of crime as well. Well, there we go. Safe to say things definitely ramped up in this episode. My word. I mean, to be honest, the first three stories were pretty chill. That last one, wow. Uh, f- f- goodness me. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than accusing someone of, of having or creating CP. I mean, that is just revolting. And, and to be honest, I think you should go to prison for that. I mean, you have to be arrested for that. That is such a bold, huge claim that can absolutely destroy someone's life, even if it's not true, that I think the ramifications have to be serious for the person making that claim, 
if it is completely false and they know it's completely false and they're just doing it to, I don't know, destroy your image. To be honest though, despite all you did, which was great, it seemed that in the end, he was the one that actually pressed his own self-destruct button, right? I mean, where did that come from? The fact that he impersonated a police officer and walked into a theme park with a gun. What the heck? I mean, I did not see that coming. Just shows that this guy was absolutely insane. I think that the incel is a, is a pretty good word to describe him. Let's be realistic. Although it's probably more than that. I don't really know what he was planning to do with that gun though. That is the scary thing. And based on the other stuff that we've seen him do throughout this, this story, I don't know. I'm, I'm only just kind of thankful that he was caught before anything serious happened. Threaten my friend with revenge, Pron. I'll ruin your whole dang life. My very good friend made some slightly dumb mistakes and sent some pictures to someone that she reasonably thought she could trust, but not knowing much more than his first name, his screen name, and roughly where he lived and the type of work he did. He is not in our country, but had indicated that he would be traveling for work to near us shortly, and they'd made some plans to meet. And when she got some red flags and backed out, the dude threatened to publish these pictures online. I am, incidentally, an attorney. So, some searching later and gathering up any pictures he sent her of him that could possibly identify him, his online handle led me to a TikTok page, which led me to an Instagram page with his name on it. That led to a LinkedIn page with his place of work that matched a picture he sent with a branded polo he was wearing. Some more searches got me the email of the CEO, the VP of HR, operations manager, and the public relations manager. I just fired off an email on behalf of my client of the screenshots of him threatening revenge prawn, snippets of the conversation showing that username while he sent that exact picture of him wearing his company's branded apparel links to how i know it's him along with pictures he sent her of his motorcycle with the license plate showing as further proof that it is him i also included screenshots of him discussing a workplace incident that were timestamps along with pieces of dialogue discussing how he had sex with an ex at his place of work and discussing plans to have sex with her in his office as well i also included a picture he sent her showing his work laptop with his entire outlook calendar along with proprietary information which he sent to prove he was busy along with other pictures he took of his workplace with non-consenting employees. I further informed his employer that I will be forwarding all this information to local, to them, law enforcement. And since he'd indicated that he'd be traveling to the US soon, we'll also forward this to the local office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. As, since my client is a US citizen on US soil, these threats constituted a federal crime. So that should they continue with his employment and continue with their plans to send him to the United States for work, I will ensure, on behalf of my client, that federal law enforcement is waiting for him on arrival which I will do as one of the assistant US attorneys for this region is a law school buddy of mine. Since I have his license plate, I know where he lives and will be contacting his local authorities tomorrow. You dumb mother effer, thinking you were hiding around anonymity, thinking you could threaten my friend? It took me 45 minutes to destroy your life. Okay, so I'm recording this on the 5th of April, 2024. What I've just read there was posted on the 4th of April in the morning. And there is an update to come, phenomenally, which was posted literally just a few hours ago at the time of recording this. Now, before we get into that, I just want to give my initial thoughts. Yeah, I mean, what else can you say really other than, you know, F around and find out? If you're going to try something like this and you're not clever and you're leaving clues and, and hints as to who you really are, in the modern day with technology, it's really not that hard to do a little bit of digging. I mean, yes, you've got unlucky, I guess unlucky in, in air quotes here that that the person that you're doing this to has a friend who's a good lawyer. But I mean, anyone could do this. It's not that hard. If you're leaving clues like this, it's so easy to find who you are, where you live, who you work for, etc., etc. And you've just ruined your entire life. What for? For threatening something stupid like this? Really? Was it worth it? Obviously not. I mean, you deserve it absolutely but he's just so dumb then again he's probably not expecting this sort of level i would love to see his face as he realizes this unravels i mean we're going to get into the update right now to see what happens next but my word imagine this you send off a threat online think nothing of it think oh i'm so clever and anonymous here and i'm gonna get what i want and then the following happens let's get into the update okay now let's get into the update of that one posted just 22 hours ago at the time of recording like i said in the intro this is a very fresh story so barely 12 hours later this happened before i get into the update though i want to clarify a few things from my original post primarily about the contact of the employer and why 
Some questioned its truthfulness. While the entire story is true, some details were omitted for various reasons. There was more she and I had in our possession that did positively identify this individual. So, would a lawyer contact his employer like some stated would not be done? Well, it depends. I did not do what I did on behalf of a client who retained me. I did it as a friend to help a friend. And as her friend, who was also a labor and employment law attorney, I knew exactly how to squeeze this. And here is the thing. I was absolutely aware from the onset that the revenge prom threat would go nowhere with his employer. Even if I could clearly lay out how the person with this screen name was in fact this person who works at that company, all we had were screenshots. If it was just the revenge prom threat, any employer would go, well, thank you for bringing it to our attention. But even if we accept our employee uses this screen name and we neither confirm nor deny anyone of that name works here, we have no provenance on this. This is just an alleged screenshot of an alleged conversation that could be easily edited and manipulated. Please feel free to pursue this with local authorities and rest assured, should we be asked to, we will cooperate fully with any law enforcement inquiry, but we have no further comment at this time. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. These days, it's so easy to edit absolutely anything and I guess that's why a company couldn't really use it. And I know that's what they would say because that's exactly what I would say. An alleged screenshot of an alleged conversation that was allegedly sent under an alleged username that's allegedly one of our employees, whatever, dude. Call the cops if you're worried about it. We'll answer them honestly if they come to us. So no, the issue wasn't the revenge prom threat. It was the picture of the contents of the work laptop because that can't be faked. There's no way of her or me to create a false image of the actual proprietary information on his work computer unless he sends it. There is no way for me or her to have possession of images taken of his coworkers without their consent unless he sent them. The proof here wasn't that this person broke the law, it's that he sent pictures of company employees and property, which would absolutely be verifiable by their IT department, that yes, this absolutely is his laptop. That's what would get him fired. So I advised my friend not to block him, to sit back and wait and not respond to anything, but let him dig himself deeper. And respond, he did. Oh, and one more update, he's been fired. So with now definitive proof that the individual in the online conversation is in fact this person, we'll forward it all to the local authorities in his country, along with his license plate number. They are more than capable of getting his home address. Well, OP, fair play to you. It's one thing me saying at the end of the first post, you know, it's easy to, to do this now to track people down online. It's another thing doing it legally and making sure you know exactly what you're doing and then carrying out what you want to happen so well to as you say yeah completely destroy this guy's life very fairly and, and very justly in just what 45 minutes i don't really get why people need an extra explanation i think you explained it perfectly at the start op um there are a few weird comments down below apparently people were confused i wasn't confused i think you explained it perfectly well and um yeah it was just really well executed from from start to finish definitely the most professional nuclear revenge that i've seen Normally, we get some crazy stuff that is either bordering on illegal or is just very illegal. This was nuclear because it absolutely destroyed someone's life, but it was so professionally and expertly done, it doesn't even feel nuclear. It just feels right. Okay, now let's move on to our next story of nuclear revenge. How about this for a title? Didn't really want to post on this account, but it's the only one that met the karma requirements. Not too much given away there. Let's go. Okay, bear with me. I'm dyslexic and struggle with writing. Me and my girlfriend moved up to a remote little town a year ago. It's so peaceful and amazing, best decision of our lives. We were looking at places to buy and we came across a house that was pretty bad. The foundation was collapsing, the roof was collapsing, there was a rodent problem, but it was on 10 acres or something close to that, a beautiful plot of land. My girlfriend falls in love with this place. It's 215,000. Yeah, not gonna go for something that's that bad. I work construction and I don't wanna come home to then work again. Now my girlfriend's friend, let's call her Patricia. Sounds like a female dog name. I never bothered trying to remember her real one. Offered to buy the place and then sell it to us later. Yeah, no, um, she said we'll talk about it, but I stand on a hard no and then my girlfriend tells Patricia no. Patricia and her boyfriend, Mitch, that's his actual name. I don't care if he sees this. In fact, I hope they do. Wow, that is a rarity for someone on Reddit to say, no, that is his actual name. No fake names here. And I hope you see this. Already bought the house, thinking we'd buy it from them for more than the 215K. 
But okay, cool. My girlfriend has her friend moving out here that she's known since she was three. I told them that if they buy the materials and the tools and I keep the tools when they're done, I'll do the work for them for no additional cost because I lost all my tools when we moved. Now this Mitch guy trashes all over me about how he works in finance and doesn't need any help. Okay, whatever. I tell him what he needs to work on first because there are major issues, but I get pooped on again. Okay, let's talk about my girlfriend now. So she has PTSD, BPD, and a couple of other things that I don't remember off the top of my head. She struggles to make friends. So this is a big deal for her. She is super excited. So when they get here, they don't visit her. They don't give any idea that they talk every day and every night, but then they get here and they block her on everything. It absolutely destroys her because she doesn't understand what she did wrong. Now they were upset and were cussing her out because she apparently tricked them into buying the place. She didn't. I told them not to because I was never going to say yes. Now fast forward a year or so. They're on Facebook complaining about all the issues that I pointed out were issues they'd need to fix. So this actual crackhead Mitch is cussing us out. Now I am just tired of this at this point. So I call the city and pretty much wrap them out. I say they have plumbing issues, electrical issues, the roof and the floor is caving in, support issues, rodent problem, all of which can get it condemned. So guess what happened? I made a complaint and got it condemned. Then I went to his place of work and filed a report with corporate about his drug issues because he's a financial advisor at a bank and I don't think he should be anywhere near anyone else's money. I hope they enjoy 215,000 worth of debt with no job and nowhere to stay because I'm done getting cussed out and having them drag my girlfriend's name through the mud because they thought they could jack up the price and sell it to us. Damn, what great friends they must be trying to buy a house for you, but in reality, just charge you more than the original price of the house. Terrible people. What I hope is that when the bank gets hold of this house, repossesses it, that they kind of, I don't know, look to resell it to somebody like you for less than the original price. I think what you then probably have to do is just knock it all down and start again. It sounds like there are so many issues here that aren't even worth bothering with. So maybe you'd have to do that and it probably would be a lot of work. If you can make it work and the price is not too expensive, it does sound like it's a beautiful property. And I feel like you've gone through enough now to warrant that level of extra effort if you can be bothered. But yeah, as for the story, just from what I've read, all I can say is that, that they're just terrible people. Imagine that saying, oh, I can't wait to move to your town. It's gonna be so fun. We're talking every night, like so excited to come down, spend loads of time together. And also like, I'm doing you such a favor by, by buying this house for you. We'll be in it for a short time. Then look, we'll, we'll sell it to you for a cheaper price. Just we'll, we'll make sure it's, it's ready for you and no one else gets it. Then just blocking them and saying, oh, actually you can't have the house. And also, why did you force us to buy it? Great friends right there. Not going to pay me overtime? Think again. I was discussing this sub with a good friend and he said, boy, have I got a story that will fit. Now it wasn't his story, but his brother's. And I sat with him and got the details. Buckle up, it's a good one and a long one. Let's call him Bob. Bob has been fiddling with computers since he was a kid and knows them pretty well. As with most IT people, he's moved from job to job. The employee he worked for was a service slash distribution company and there were two IT employees. The company was located in Ontario, Canada. About three years ago, Bob's employer decided to modernize their software. They had separate programs for dispatching, for infantry, for payroll and finances, and it was complicated moving information from one program to the other. They decided to get an ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning Program, and Bob recommended one that he knew inside out from a previous employer. For those of you who don't know, an ERP program handles everything. Purchase orders, sales, inventory, personnel, vendors, customers, all of it. You can run a report and find out which customer has bought the most part ABC in the last year, which salesman has improved his numbers the most, which vendor has the fastest delivery time, which shipper packed the most orders. Everyone in the company used the ERP program, but it was very complicated and they used the aspects of it that related to their position. For example, the receiver would accept a shipment, verify the quantity, confirm it was received, and the inventory stats would be available to the salespeople if they wanted to look up how many were on hand. The receiver didn't care what the price was or who the vendor was, he just did his job. Now, Bob was run ragged during the implementation process, but he managed to train most of the employees on their aspects. And after a few months, everything was running fairly smoothly. Bob still got tickets for tweaks in the operation of the software and occasional hardware IT issues. Then the company decided to expand their footprint and was marketing into different time zones. That messed things up. 
Atlantic Canada is 90 minutes early. So if someone sent an email or an order at 8 a.m. their time, it would arrive at 6.30 a.m. Ontario time. Pacific Canada is three hours late. So an email sent at 3 p.m. Vancouver time would arrive at 6 p.m. This stretched out the day. So many staff came in early and worked late. Bob would arrive at 8 a.m. And there'd be people that demanded his immediate assistance and were annoyed that he didn't respond instantly, even though their requests were submitted before his start time. Same with later in the day. His phone would ring at dinner time with people that wanted help right now. They decided to stagger his and his IT colleague shift times. Bob would start at 6 a.m. and work until 2.30 and his colleague would start at 10.30 a.m. and work till 7. Bob's colleague had kids and refused the shift change. The employer insisted the colleague quit. That meant that Bob was the only person in the IT department. The employer said they'd look to hire a new IT guy, but they had trouble finding one that knew the ERP system and they were offering well under a market value salary. Bob asked for a raise and was denied. Then he wanted overtime and the employer told him that as an IT specialist, he was exempt from overtime laws in Ontario. Bob looked it up and the employer was correct. This went on for some time and he knew lots of IT people socially. They told him what the company was offering and Bob knew that they wouldn't find another tech. Things went downhill from there. Bob would get chewed out if he missed a call or an email, no matter what time it came in. He had to train new hires in the ERP system as well as take care of the hardware. He asked repeatedly for better compensation and was denied. So he planned to get a new job. Now here is the revenge. Bob had access to the entirety of the ERP program. When a user signed in, the time was logged. And even if they didn't sign out, after 15 minutes, it would log them out anyway. Everyone in the company was on salary and many of them came in early and stayed late. Ontario labor laws states that even salaried workers are entitled to overtime after 44 hours a week, unless they were managers or supervisors. So Bob jumped into the program and ran a report for each employee that wasn't a manager all the way back to when the ERP program was started. Then he reached out to an employment lawyer and got the okay to refer employees to him. Bob lined up another job and after he left, every employee in the company got an email with an Excel sheet showing the hours they had put in past 44 hours a week. The subject line said, you're legally entitled to overtime pay and in the body of the email was the lawyer's name. The poop hit the fan. Almost every employee authorized the lawyer to negotiate with the company on their behalf, and the company had to pay a ton of money. All the company had to do was pay Bob for the extra work he put in. Instead, they had to pay almost everyone. Okay, great revenge, I'm not gonna lie, but my main takeaway from this, my main emotion, is just feeling bad for just all the employees in general to work for this horrible company. Bob, obviously, on the one hand, having to do not just two people's jobs, but more like, it seems like five or six. I mean, those shift times are ridiculous, and he is the only one that knows how this all works. That is such a specialized role that he's not even being paid for properly at all. I mean, it's not even close, it sounds like. And then, all the other employees who were doing overtime, but then haven't been getting paid for it. What if Bob had never done this? They would have just done all those hours and, and never been given the money for them? It's ridiculous. So yeah, I mean, shout out Bob for, for helping out so many employees that were just being completely manipulated and just not given what they deserved. It's just sad that it had to come to that. Crazy. Pay the man the money he's worth for his skill, and this would never, ever have happened. But then again, you could also say just pay the employees what they deserve and are owed for the overtime and they'll probably be more happy as well and it would just you know contribute to a much better working environment and the company would probably do way better because of it i don't know it's just a weird one i feel like it's backwards policy from a company like this just trying to you know scrimp and save money when in reality you're expanding you're clearly doing well pay your staff more and they'll pay it back to you in terms of output and yeah the company will just do better i don't know it's just weird business practice isn't it really but um Great revenge nonetheless. I ruined my ex-boyfriend's life 20 plus years ago and I just made sure it stayed ruined. When I was in college in the 90s, I met Jake, then a 23 year old man through mutual friends. He had already graduated and was planning to move to the opposite side of the United States for grad school. And I'd already been making plans to move with friends only a 90 minute drive away from where he was moving to. We had so much in common, fell in love and it really seemed like fate both planning to move 3,000 miles and landing so close together. 
He had two sisters and a younger brother who were all awesome people and I became instant friends with them as well. Because he was in school and I was working, I would usually go to him to hang out on the weekends. He was renting a house with two roommates also in his program. We were young, so money was tight, but we had fun, went for taco dates and spent a lot of time at his house where he was breeding and selling small animals. Jake was an animal sciences PhD student, so being around animals was normal and I loved it. I met and became friends with his advisor's wife, Mary, who was in her mid 50s, who worked in administration at the university. She is a lovely woman. I'd often have lunch with her when I went over on the weekends. Jake was a teaching assistant and I met other people in the program and made friends with them faster than he did. After about two years of dating, I was at the house one day, laying in bed together in a state of some undress. And he said, out of the blue, he was concerned I'd been gaining weight and it made it harder for him to be attracted to me. No concern about my health. It was all about him finding me unattractive. I sat up and said, well, then maybe you should make sure there's better food for me to eat than crackers and cheese when I come up on weekends. Even at 23, I didn't take that kind of BS. I had gained maybe 10 pounds since meeting him two years earlier and still wore the same size clothes, about a US size six to eight. I wasn't gonna engage in a fight about it after all. It was his problem, not mine. So I asked him calmly, what is your solution to this? He stared at me blankly and said, well, I guess that you should try to lose weight. And I said, nah, I'm not going to do that. So what are you going to do about it? He said, well, I guess nothing. I wanted to let you know how I feel. And I said, cool, thank you. Put my clothes back on, went to sleep and drove home the next day as usual. We keep dating. And about three months later, he called me and said he wanted to break up after close to three years. The reason, and I quote, you don't know enough about science. He felt like he couldn't have a conversation with me about his work where he didn't have to use common names for animals instead of scientific ones. I said, well, that's bull. What's the real reason? He said it was the real reason. He came to see me a month later to return something of mine and I confronted him, demanding the real reason. He finally admitted that he'd been seeing one of his undergrad students. Let's call her Meg, a 19 year old. He was then 26 and her teacher. I screamed at him to leave. My roommate threatened to throw him off our second floor balcony if he didn't go, and he left. It hit me all at once after he walked out, and I went from rage to stunned laughter. I'd actually met Meg a few times, and at one point, she was at his house for a barbecue and spilled something all over her pants. Jake asked me if I could loan her some sweats. Now, I couldn't because I was a size 8, and she was a size 18. There's nothing wrong with that at all, but the point is... I realized he made those comments about my weight to try and get me to break up with him because he was a coward. He clearly liked a big girl. Although when he said those things to me about my weight, it was 1 a.m. I lived about 95 miles away and we just had sex. So I don't know how he thought that would go. Even in hindsight, it perplexes me. Did he think I was going to break up with him and storm off into the night and drive for an hour and a half? Anyway, I emailed his roommates. It was the early 2000s. It's how you communicated anything you didn't want to say on the phone. I wanted to let them know that we'd broken up and they were always lovely to me and I thanked them for being friends. They both admitted though that they knew about Meg and were the ones to demand that Jake tell me or they would. That is when he broke up with me with the lame you don't understand science excuse. One of his roommates, a super nice, super cute guy named George, offered to help me get a few things still at their house that he collected for me away from around the house. He suggested I come up for the weekend. We go out and drink, have a good time. All the things that Jake didn't want to waste money on. And I said, sure. So I went up and George let me into the house while Jake was gone. I took photos of all of his animals because while I might not be a PhD student, I paid attention and I knew he had an endangered species in his care. He wasn't breeding it. It was an unreleasable animal that he'd taken in from a rescue organization. There was paperwork he had to submit with a $25 fee and he refused to do it, saying he didn't want the government in his business. I took photos of that animal, all his breeding conditions and a photo of an animal not allowed in the state, which was in a tank right next to a window and visible from outside. I then went out for a night on the town with George. We stumbled in early, around midnight, so Jake and Meg, who were watching TV, would see me in a short dress, drunk, and George practically carrying me. I spent the night in George's room. 
he was a total gentleman but made sure to leave the room and parade past them in his boxes a few times and we giggled and moaned loudly so they could hear us when i went to leave the next morning jake said i didn't have to act like a whore in front of him as i ate a donut slowly in my rumbled dress with messy hair while george beamed at me and then planted a kiss on my forehead meg looked ashamed not quite knowing where to look and i said have fun with my leftovers and walked out I wanted to think that the petty, loud hookup and a few juvenile insults was my revenge. It was not. The next day, I had my photos developed. Ah, the good old days. And I called the state office of Fish and Wildlife. I reported the animals in the house, the potential overcrowding of breeding animals, and the two animals he shouldn't legally have at all in the state, and I asked them how to make a report. Well, it turns out that Jake wasn't well liked by his peers in his program or by his roommates, but I was. George had suggested that he and their other roommate could submit complaints to the university that a TA was sleeping with one of his students and showing her favoritism. The night we were out at the bars, we made sure to tell the story to anyone who they knew. They made sure all the women in his classes knew he was sleeping with Meg. It wasn't a large program. People knew fast that he cheated and was now dating a student. George and the other roommate made sure people knew they had put in complaints. They were sick of Jake's entitled BS. With my full statement made and photos sent to the state wildlife officials, I called my friend Mary, Jake's advisor's wife. She knew about the breakup and the lame reason, and I let her know that he admitted he was sleeping with a student. I'd been emailing with him and he admitted to it in writing, so I sent that to Mary. To say she was not happy about that was an understatement. She said she made sure it would be investigated and told her husband, Jake's direct advisor while I was on the phone with her. Speaking of investigations, a few weeks later, George called me, Giddy, to say that state fish and wildlife officials were there confiscating the animals. He told them he'd be happy to tell them whatever they needed to know. Meg was there when it happened and told the officials that as far as she knew, all the animals belonged to her boyfriend, Jake, and that they were all legal. That put George and the other roommate in the clear. One animal was kept in the backyard, so it was implied to Jake that a neighbor reported it. While they were there to investigate, they knew to look in the back window to see the far more problematic, illegal to have in the state under nearly any circumstances, animal. Since George was on the lease, he was able to let them in to investigate in the house. The animals were all in communal areas and the officers stayed there for a few hours and returned with a warrant to take all the animals and enter jake's room to investigate george and the other roommate let them into their rooms with no issues and they were quickly cleared meg apparently couldn't get a hold of jake and eventually drove to the university to find him remember no cell phones yet it was a good day the only animals they left were some guppies in a fish tank now phd students need grant money to do research and a large part of animal studies funding comes from the federal government jake had just gotten an epa grant right around when he broke up with me So I called the EPA and asked how I would report that a person with a federal grant was being investigated for illegally harboring endangered animals. Long story short, he lost his EPA grant and had to make restitution on what had already been used, close to $30,000. He would never be able to get another federal grant. He avoided jail time on the state charges since all the animals were in good health, but lost all his breeding animals, worth thousands of dollars, since they were collected for safekeeping during the investigation when the two illegal animals were taken. In the end, he owed a $15,000 fine and the two animals went to a nearby nature center. For years, I would stop by if I was in the area to visit them. The university revoked his scholarship and fired him from teaching for having an inappropriate relationship with a student. He somehow escaped being expelled, but it always shocked me that he never tried to hide the relationship with Meg and was so stupidly self-assured that he didn't even wait the four weeks until she would have been done with his class to start publicly dating her. By the university rules, he would have then been in the clear to date her, not being her teacher anymore, and she would just have to avoid any classes he was a TA in. It never fails to make me laugh. After a few months, I emailed his sisters and told them I missed them because Jake broke up with me after trying to call me fat and cheating on me and I felt weird contacting them. The girls told me that he told the family I broke up with him because of the distance. I forwarded them emails that Jake wrote after the breakup talking about how he fell for Meg and he was sorry about it but it was true. I couldn't keep up with him academically and it made him attracted to Meg. Jake managed to convince his dad to pay for one more year of school so that he could get a master's instead of a PhD. 
And while I stayed in contact with his sisters and brother via email and then social media, I largely let it all go. I got even, I made some friends, Mary became like an auntie to me and I went on with life. I went on to get a master's degree myself and my speciality, helping scientists and doctors communicate their work to lay people. You know, us dummies who can't remember all the scientific names. I swear, it happened by accident, not design, but I love it. And I work with everyone from small town doctors and nurses to pharmaceutical companies, to museums, to state and federal governments, to film and TV producers. I travel a lot and speak and get to learn a lot of cool things about our planet and how things work. That is amazing. I knew through his siblings that Jake and Meg got married and had two kids. Meg dropped out of the sciences and became an accountant. Jake went back to breeding animals. Every once in a while, his sisters or brother would tell me something over a lunch or via text, but we had our own relationship that exists outside of him. Apparently, when I sent a wedding gift for one of his sisters, he loudly complained at a co-ed bridal shower that all of his siblings still were my friend and didn't make an effort to embrace his now wife, Meg. Apparently, the sister just laughed and said, I don't make it a habit to be friends with home wreckers. This is how Jake's parents found out how their relationship started and ours ended, truthfully, 10 years after we broke up. Jake never found out I was behind reporting him to the state, and in the end, I didn't lie about a single thing, except maybe exaggerating a drunken makeout session with George, who is now a successful and tenured professor with a lovely wife and daughters. Now, fast forward about 20 years to a few weeks ago. I was at a university giving a lecture to a room of 250 undergrad and grad students. In the end, I was mingling with the students afterwards, and I hear a voice say, Hey, OP, long time no see. And I realize it's Jake. And my facial expression did not change at all. I was completely shocked, but my instinct was to play dumb. So I said, I'm sorry, help me out. Have we met at another workshop or lecture? He looked incredulous and said, it's me, Jake. And I said, I can't place you, but I'd love to figure it out. Finally, I gasped and said, oh my goodness, Jake, I guess I blocked you out. And I said, well, lovely to see you. And I moved on quickly when he tried to reach out and hug me. I was happy to leave it there with the satisfaction of him seeing me as a guest lecturer in a science department of a major university when he was just in the audience. The department chair and faculty who'd invited me to speak took me out to dinner. And while there, one of them said, so, you know, Jake, I said I did from over 20 years ago, being vague about how. She went on to tell me that he had been there for an interview for a teaching position and had spent a few days there observing and they were likely going to hire him. I couldn't control it. I scoffed. When they all looked at me, I said, I'm sorry. I'm just shocked that he's teaching after what happened back at university. They said, what happened? And I said, well, he was sleeping with a 19 year old student when he was 26 and he had to leave the program without a PhD because he couldn't afford to stay after losing his scholarship. The three people I was with all looked at each other like they knew they had a problem and said, wow, we'll have to look into that and change the subject. My old friend Mary, retired a year or two now, but still friendly with her old colleagues, called me this weekend to say a friend at the university let her know that someone had called doing a background check about Jake and they pulled his file, which included being fired, leaving the program with a lower degree and the complaint letters from over 20 years ago about his conduct. Mary's name had been on it with her husband listed as the faculty advisor, so she thought that she'd like to know. As a bonus, it had a copy of his arrest record for the illegal animals. I guess his dad had paid for a decent lawyer to get the record expunged after the charges were reduced and he paid the fines so it doesn't show up on a standard background check. I don't think he's gonna get that job. So I will return to my life content that the universe comes through sometimes, especially if you give it a little nudge just now and then. The best revenge is when you don't have to do anything wrong, you just have to help direct knowledge to the right places. If there is anything I can impart to any young women and men reading this, as I shimmy happily into my now size 10 pants, it's that if someone who is supposed to love you complains about your weight or looks, that is their problem to fix mentally, not yours. And maybe it's time to check out what they are doing behind your back or simply move on. Remember though, it's their flaw, not yours. If Jake hadn't been a coward and tried to make me break up with him and just ended things with me in a mature way, I might not have found out about Meg and turned his own wickedness back on himself. Okay, and there we go. That is the end of that one. Wow. First thing I've got to say is fantastic revenge. 
very much justified. There is absolutely no way this guy should ever be allowed to work in any form of education again. He completely ruined that chance by having a relationship as a TA with one of the students. That is is my my immediate conclusion from that, and I'm, I'm very happy to be fair that you've you've made sure and you continue to ensure that that won't happen. Now the next point is, and I want to ask your thoughts on this, guys. Do you think that? This guy, Jake, should still be getting punished 20 years later for mistakes that he made 20 years ago. Do you think that's a little bit too long? I mean, do we still punish him 80 years later for these mistakes? Are you allowed to make mistakes and, you know, be punished for them? Sure. But ultimately, I'm playing devil's advocate here slightly, but he's done nothing illegal, yet his life is still being ruined 20 years later. Is that not a little bit harsh or is that justice for what he did? I mean, we don't know the effect that it had on, on the 19 year old. Clearly, you know, he's abused that, that, that level of power there and who knows what effect it's had on the girl. But you get what I'm saying? 20 years later, still getting punished for something he did when he was half his age? I don't know. Seems perhaps a little bit harsh, but I think it's potentially fair. I also do think that OP, like, let's just make sure that she definitely has moved on and it's not still kind of trauma in her mind. Yes, it's great to make sure that someone has the revenge they deserve, but 20 years of this, not not saying that, you know, she's done loads and it's always on her mind. Just, I want to make sure that she has moved on with her life. I feel like by the end, we are, we're getting towards that stage, but I don't want it to be an ongoing thing for the rest of her life. But yeah, um, I don't know. Maybe it's just a little bit too much for it to still be going on now. I think now's the time to leave it. Or do we carry on and just ruin this guy's life forever? Give me some like real actual answers in, in the comments. Not just, oh, he did a terrible thing. He deserves for his entire life to be ruined for 80 years and then die. Let's be realistic. Okay, I want to hear some actual, some actual logic and some cohesive thoughts, which you, to be fair, you guys always give me. There's no need for me to say that, but you get what I'm saying. I mean, you could also say that, you, you know, the revenge was, was at the time good. You told the correct authorities, the school, the whatever it's called, fish and animal people, the people that deal with the animals, about what was going on. They came and dealt with it. That was it. And again, I have to maintain, he should not work in a school again. But outside of that, I don't know if he still deserves to be getting punished. Maybe he does. I I'm not completely decided to be honest. I actually reckon he probably does. But it is just harsh. But, you know, if you are the sort of person that would do this, yeah, maybe you do deserve to be punished forever. I don't know. Like, people in the comments are saying that, that well, ultimately what he did was cheat on you in the 90s with a woman over the age, over the age of consent, over, the, over the, the legal age. So it's a bad move, but it's not a crime. Now, does he deserve to be punished 20 years later? Even if he was the TA. Um, people are saying that, you know, what you did with George OP was fantastic. And I agree, that was brilliant. No doubt about that. And maybe even staying friends with the family is, is fine as well. Although to be fair, a little bit weird 20 years later. But yeah, like devastating the dude's entire life, ruining his career, continuing to do damage for decades afterwards. After he's like worked his way back up from, from nothing and it seems as if he's trying to live a proper life and he's still not doing that well, right? I mean, he's he's applying for jobs that probably should be, you know, a level ahead of by, by his, his 40s. And... I don't know, maybe it's just a little bit too much. Again, maybe I'm just waffling here. Let me know in the comments down below. You guys are the voice of reason on this channel, not me. Got rude guy arrested for suspended license. In the mid 2000s, my friends and I would frequent a small billiards place in a neighboring town where you could rent a table by the hour or play per game. We'd play a few games, watch whatever sports were on TV and have casual conversations. There were no problems and no drama until about three months of us visiting this place. A guy shows up and takes our spot at the billiards table. No big deal. We were all chatting anyway. 20 minutes later, my friend lets him know that we want to play the next game, but this jerk is super dismissive. Needless to say, we didn't get in during the next game. So I politely let him know we wanted to play next. Another lady chimed in that she wanted the game after us. The guy blatantly ignored me and the other woman. Some more time goes by and the guy leaves the table. We see our chance to get in. We put the quarters in and the balls are dispensed, except the green six ball. The guy took it to the bathroom with him. At this point, it was ridiculous and we notified the manager. The manager noted it was 12.30 and they were going to be calling last call and closing, so we didn't want to make a scene by kicking him out. He gets us another ball so that we can play. The guy comes out of the bathroom and knows that we realized what he did. He smirks and proceeds to the patio to have a cigarette, bringing along his beer and the green billiard ball. The guy comes back in and tossed the ball he was holding onto the table, hitting a few balls on it and messing up our game. He goes up to the bar just in time for last call. One of the friends I was with suggested we follow him home and each call the highway patrol to report a suspected drunk driver. 
three of four of us agree. So when he leaves, we used our trusty Nextel push to talk phones and coordinated several calls to the police. We provided details like license plate, vehicle make, and model and color, and mentioned the car nearly hit another vehicle, was swerving between lines, and driving erratically. This was under a 15 minute plan. We had no idea where the guy lived, but suspected it was close as he was visiting a neighborhood place, so our time was limited. The one guy who didn't notify the police tailed the jerk and called us giddy when a police officer pulled between him and the guy and turned on his lights to pull him over. The police blotter that week included an arrest of a guy who was pulled over after multiple calls of erratic driving. He wasn't arrested for DWI, but instead for driving on a suspended license. Well, there we go. Dealt with phenomenally well. I'm actually quite interested to know how this guy wasn't done for, for drink driving. Maybe he did just have a couple of couple of drinks and that was all. But still, I'm not sure I'd necessarily advocate that, even though it's it's within the limit, just about. But yeah, good to see that you guys got some justice. Because what kind of guy does this? I mean, seriously. Like, Fair enough if you want to play an extra game. I mean, is that even fair? I'm not sure. You know, if you want to play two games and you say to people, listen, I, I know that you're waiting, but I really just want to play another game. I mean, even then, you should just give the table up. Sorry, you should. But then what he did after that, taking the green ball to the toilet. I mean, what? I've never heard of someone doing that. And then ruining the, the, the game, the next game, by chucking it on the table just for the sake of it. Why? I think he deserves to be arrested just for that pettiness and just being a jerk in general. Good revenge. Okay, that's going to do it for the first story of revenge in this episode. Let's move on to the second. Now, I want to give a little bit of context here because it might seem like it's a little bit boring and professional and mundane. But trust me, this isn't one of those. It's really, really good. And the justice is excellent. It's definitely one of the most well-written pieces that I've read in a while. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's about someone that we all kind of hate, right? landlords i think we can all generally agree that landlords aren't aren't the best they're sometimes extremely difficult to work work with and, and and yeah deal with but you may think that residential landlords are bad actually in this situation we have a story about a commercial landlord who is absolutely horrible without further ado let's get into it a lawyer's pro revenge on a landlord landlords are jerks generally speaking everyone knows that but if you think residential landlords are bad they are nothing compared to commercial landlords Landlords of commercial buildings are some of the cruelest, nastiest people I've ever come across. This revenge tale is about a commercial landlord and how I dealt with him. Back in the 90s, sometimes I'd go for lunch at this restaurant in the basement of our building. The place was called The Vault because it had a massive bank vault that had always been there, dating back to the days before the place was turned into a restaurant. The vault was so huge that they could see a couple of tables in there and you could eat dinner surrounded by rows of old, gleaming safe deposit boxes. One day I was there for lunch and the owner took me aside. The landlord's driving me nuts, he said. The landlord drives everyone nuts. I was a subtenant in the same building, sharing space with an old lawyer, Aaron, and the landlord was always causing us trouble. I'd already had a few run-ins with him and we hated each other on site. In most jurisdictions, commercial landlords don't need court orders to get you out. Instead, they just change the locks and you find out about it when you show up and your key doesn't work. Every time our landlord had a dispute with anyone, which was often, he'd always threaten to change the locks. He keeps demanding all this stuff for extra rent. And it's really weird because a lot of it's really old. The restaurant owner showed me a letter the landlord had served on him earlier that day. I looked over the demand and read a list of expenses for snow removal and parking lot repair and common area flooring and all kinds of trash going back years. I read it all the way to the end and there it was. The usual clause saying he was going to change the locks if the tenant didn't pay this and do that. From the wording of the demand, it looks like you've been fighting a while. Why did you wait before consulting a lawyer? I asked one of the lawyers I know and he said it's hopeless. He told me the lawyer's name. It was a guy I knew with a trashy real estate practice who had resorted to taking little legal aid cases to keep the lights on when the market tanked in 89. Did you do something to make the landlord hate you? I asked. Because this is a bit over the top, even for our jerk landlord. He knows I'm moving the restaurant. I think he's trying to grab as much money as possible before I go. Plus, he's giving me grief over the vault. He won't let you take it with you? Are you kidding? It weighs almost 100 tons and I don't need it. But the lease says I have to remove it and that I also have to restore the building to what it was before there was a vault. That would cost a fortune. 
The jerk landlord says if I leave the vault behind when I move, he'll sue. Send your lease up to my office and let me look it over, I said. I finished my lunch and when I got back to my office, the lease was waiting for me. It was just as bad as the restaurant owner said. The lease was a renewal of a renewal of an assignment of a renewal. The original documents dating back to shortly after World War II when a bank first leased the place and the vault was installed. Somehow, the landlord had suckered the restaurant into taking over a lease that left him liable to remove a bank vault at the end of the term. That is crazy. No big deal, I thought. The restaurant can default and all the landlord can do is sue a shell company. But when I got to the last page of the lease, there was a guarantee clause. The restaurant owner had personally guaranteed the lease and he was on the hook for removing a vault weighing 100 tons and then fixing the place up. It would cost a fortune. To be fair, moral of the story so far is you've got to read the contract in full for anything like this because, wow, being personally liable for a 100 ton vault is crazy. The case was hopeless, of course. That was obvious right away. But then I thought about the jerk landlord with his demands and his threats and his rent hikes and I asked my brain to do me a solid, which it promptly did. I picked up the phone and called the restaurant owner. I'm screwed, right? You're calling me to say there's no way out. That's what my commercial lawyer already said, but I just thought I'd ask. Well, I can save you, but it's gonna cost. How much? 5,000 illegals and another G note for the agent. Agent? What kind of agent? Real estate. Send up a check, certified, and leave the rest to me. The check hit my desk in less than an hour. I went to Aaron's office. I need a real estate agent, I said. You buying a house? Nope. Selling a house? Nope. By this point, I'd been sharing space with Aaron for almost five years and he knew me pretty well. You pulling one of your stunts again? He asked. Yep, but nothing that will get you into trouble. All right, I know a guy. Aaron knew all kinds of guys and that's one of the reasons he eventually got disbarred. But he knew a guy and he gave me the agent's name and number. And the next day I paid the agent a visit. I told him what I needed and we agreed to terms. I gave him some papers and the cash for his fee. A few days later, I was again at the vault for lunch. The owner saw me walk in and greeted me himself. The landlord's here, he said. Why? For lunch and to be a jerk. Let's sit in the vault room so I don't have to look at his face. He took me to the vault room and with the door almost completely closed, we had a consultation while we ate pasta and drank red wine. That's pretty elite, by the way, I've got to say. Imagine that, sitting in a vault, having pasta, drinking red wine. That's like movie scene right there, but I guess the circumstances aren't great, to be honest. So I said, we're making demand on the landlord, munching on spaghetti carbonara. Demand? What are we demanding? I put a document out of my briefcase and passed it to him while I sip my wine. We're demanding that the jerk landlord release all the restaurant equipment, all the fixtures, the ovens, the freezers, the ventilation, everything you need to run a restaurant. The lease exempts all that stuff. He, he can't stop me taking what I want. The only thing that matters is the vault. And of course, I don't want that. But I shook my head. You need the vault, I said. And we're demanding that he release the bank vault as well. We're insisting that he let you take it out within seven business days. You think you can beat the landlord with reverse psychology? You think if you treat him like a two-year-old, you can manipulate him into doing what you want? Well, we'll find out soon enough. He's had the demand for a couple of days now. The restaurant owner dropped his wine glass and it shattered on the marble floor. You already gave it to him, he said. He got up, swung open the vault door and called for the waiter to clean up the mess. Let's see what the landlord has to say, I told him. And we walked over to the landlord's table. The landlord was a big beefy man with a big appetite. He sat alone eating wolfishly and with his hands. My client needs an answer today, I said. The landlord looked up at me as he chewed noisily. I'm the vault's lawyer, I said. I gave you a demand the other day. My client needs an answer right now. He needs the vault for a new place and he's got to make arrangements. Your client could forget about the bank vault, he said, wiping his massive greasy hands on an already soiled napkin. But you can't do that, I said. My shock was feigned, but the restaurant owner's jaw dropped for real. The landlord laughed at us. I'm the landlord. I can do what I want. I'm going to need that in writing because my client might sue, I said. Sue all you like, the landlord told me. Sue till you're blue in the face. He told me that I'd have a formal response by the day's end, and then he told me to go away and let him finish his lunch. When the letter arrived from the landlord, claiming ownership over the bank vault, I brought it downstairs and showed it to my client. How the heck did you do that? Trade secret, I said. 
The following month, the restaurant moved out and the place was empty. And that was too bad because I'd always liked eating at the vault. Now the restaurant was in a new location 20 minutes away. They called the new place the vault and they'd preserved the vibe of the old place. It was very similar, except they didn't have the bank vault. The bank vault, all 100 tons of it, was where it had always been, in the basement of the building where I rented space. I showed up for work a little after that and Aaron collared me. The landlord's looking for you, he said. Oh yeah, what about? He's really angry. He said his deal fell through. Deal? He was supposed to rent the place downstairs to a new tenant, a bank or a credit union or something like that. They were supposed to come in to sign a lease, but they didn't show up. And what's that got to do with me? I said to Aaron. And I said the same thing again to the landlord when he managed to track me down a couple of days later. I know you were behind this, he said, his jowls quivering. I know it was you. That offer from the agent, it was all BS. Just a trick to make me keep the vault so that your client could sneak out of the place and leave that freaking bank vault behind. I'm gonna sue. If you're looking for counsel, I think I'm gonna have to declare a conflict. I'm gonna sue the restaurant and the agent and I'm gonna sue you. He stormed off. But the landlord didn't sue. Of course he didn't. He didn't have a contract to sue on. Only a vague letter of intent that I drafted. Enough to hook a greedy landlord who was used to having his way. The offer he'd received was non-binding, incapable of acceptance without the signing of a formal lease, which of course never got signed. When I left Aaron's place a year later, the downstairs was still unoccupied, with a sad for rent sign sitting in the window, starting to look faded. So there we go. That is without a doubt one of the best revenge stories I've read in a long time. That was brilliant from beginning to end. What, what might have been potentially a kind of boring topic, you know, landlords and contracts and that sort of stuff, maybe not the most entertaining, so well written and really good. This guy clearly is just a, is a horrible, greedy man that, yeah, any sort of, of idea of, oh, can I make some more money from a from a new bank potentially coming in? He was all he was all for it, not even checking if they were even a real bank in the first place or, or doing any sort of, of, of due diligence there and working out what was going on. Doesn't really surprise me when he's just as selfish as this, forcing somebody to, to take a 100 ton vault with them or he'll sue i mean just absolutely ridiculous i guess this comes down to so you have to leave the the property in the same way it was when you first got it but i don't know how anyone would realistically know that first of all there was a a huge 100 ton vault and then secondly that that you had to get rid of it when you left because when you moved in it was there right but again as was explained in this one going back to the second world war and, and having a, a contract carry over from there is extremely petty. I do kind of stand by what I said though. I do think with all these things, you've got to read literally, I was gonna say word for word, but almost letter for letter, like the punctuation even is, is extremely important in these sort of contracts to make sure you're not getting absolutely shafted like this guy did. But yeah, if it wasn't for UOP, I mean, that would have been terrible, but, but thank goodness that people like you exist and just exploited the guy that was exploiting this this unlucky individual. Steal furniture, almost lose your job. So my dad owns a house that he's been renting for some time now. The tenants that lived there were for the most part, decent people who my dad thought were trustworthy. That all changed about two months into the tenancy when the tenant refused to pay the month's rent. My dad showed some leniency and gave them another month to pay up what was owed, but they didn't pay a thing. By this point, my dad, frustrated by the whole situation and being two months out of rent money, offered them a deal. Leave the house ASAP and then only pay half the money owed. They countered with a different agreement. They would leave the house in a clean state with all of their furniture left behind as compensation. My dad, wanting to just be done with them, agreed. Cut to where my dad gets to the house, finding the place in a mess with none of the furniture left behind, including the furniture that belonged to my dad in the first place. The two sofas that my dad owned were left behind, but they were trashed and left in the shed. When my dad confronted them, asking for them to pay up the full amount that the furniture was worth, he was met with a promise of payment after two weeks, which he didn't believe. And when he requested they pay earlier, he was met with, good luck getting your money, followed by laughing emojis. This made my dad angry, and he decided that he wasn't going to let this slide. My dad knew that the tenant was a Christian pastor of a church, and his son also had some job related to the church. My dad contacted the church and explained everything, from how they hadn't paid him rent money, to stealing the furniture and trashing the place. The church was somewhat interested about this behavior. 
The next day, my dad gets an angry phone call from the tenant's son, cursing at him, asking him what he thought he was doing, contacting the church, saying he was being unfair. My dad hung up on him, only for him to attempt to ring 10 times afterwards. From what we could piece together, the church had told the pastor that if he didn't settle things with my dad, him and his son would lose their jobs. My dad received the full amount for the furniture that same day and agreed to back off. My dad later said it was never about the money, but the way this guy treated him and his values. My dad, being a Christian himself, was disappointed. There we go. A nice little one to finish on there. I, I do have to say that, that it's embarrassing that, um, you know, these healthy, you know, Christian people who work for the church have this attitude. Does that not go exactly against what they're preaching? Surely it does. Like, how can they go to work each day? Like, you're, you're a pastor a pastor a pastor and and you are going to work each day preaching knowing that you're doing this at the same time how can you live with yourself i think it's kind of people like this sometimes that that give not just not just the church not just the christian church but just religion in general a bad name when in reality it's just these horrible individuals doing things but then you hear stories like this quite often and you're just like why how can somebody be in this position and, and do something like this but i guess it happens it happens all over the world in, in every single sector but yeah normally like i thought that the church would would usually pay for their residents but i don't know maybe maybe they weren't or maybe they were and these two were just you know pocketing that and then just yeah using it for whatever they wanted i will say though shout out your dad because he is a very very good man teacher insists i talk to my mother this was back in school when i was 15 16 ish I'd moved to the area suddenly and had a lot of accommodations, so most of the teachers didn't know specifically what was going on in my life, but most knew it was pretty messed up and there was an ongoing police investigation. I guess this teacher missed the memo. I was talking about prom tickets and how I collected them as I qualified for free ones. I don't remember exactly how the conversation went, so I'm kind of paraphrasing. My teacher said to me, you just need to get your mum to email to claim as many tickets as you need. I replied, Okay, I'll ask my dad to do that. She then mentioned a few other things, but every time she ignored my subtle corrections and asked me to talk to my mum. After like four times, I lost my temper and went, all right, since you insist, I'll drive for two hours, find my highly abusive mother in police custody and reconnect with her just to ask her permission for some prom tickets. Or I could ask my dad at home. She just went completely silent and a couple of nearby teachers gave her judgmental looks and I walked away. Teachers should honestly know better than to assume all kids have parents, especially both. There was another time like a month after I moved where we had an English class assignment to read and write poems about our mother. On Mother's Day, so it was already a pretty sore day for me. I just left. Should have written some poems about how she beat me for laughing wrong to teach them not to do that sort of trash. Yeah, that is extremely poor from that teacher. I mean, it's just one of those things. If you are a teacher and you have a classroom full of children, surely you shouldn't be talking generally about these sort of things. I mean, look, maybe you can, but on the whole, you've got to be so careful because who knows what you might say that could horribly upset someone. I mean, you don't know. Clearly, this woman doesn't know the individual circumstances of all her students. I think to be fair, she should, but for whatever reason, she doesn't. And I'm thinking about my own education here. I can't actually remember doing sort of like Father's Day or Mother's Day stuff in particular, even in primary school or like even back in kindergarten. I mean, I don't remember exactly in, in reception, but I don't remember it. And I feel like the teachers would know exactly what was going on with their students' parents so they wouldn't do anything that could be as traumatic as this probably for that reason but um yeah terrible from her great from uop i mean you could also argue that she's just being misogynistic anyway like like why does she keep insisting that you ask your mum because that's just assigning a gender role isn't it it's ridiculous especially in the modern day there's a lot about this teacher to dislike i will say so um yeah i'm happy you got your own back op keep touching my wheelchair when i told you no get slapped and shunned I am a wheelchair user. Wheelchairs are considered extensions of our bodies. And touching wheelchairs without the user's permission is a no-no. Moving someone's wheelchair without asking is an even bigger no-no. I'd explain to a classmate again and again that it was rude, inappropriate, and even harassment that he kept touching my chair or moving me without asking. And when I told him not to, not only did he keep doing it, 
but he was insistent that he had the right to do so. I'd even gone as far as to illustrate the issue to him by getting permission to touch his shoulder or elbows and moving him out of the way or leaving my hand on his shoulder and leaving it there until it was awkward. Even this though didn't dissuade him or change his entitled insistence that he had every right to touch my chair whenever he wanted to, even when I'd told him no. Anyway, usually he'd let go, kind of scoff and move on. This was over the course of most of a college semester. It was a voice class at a community college, so there were less than 20 of us. So our professor had witnessed many of these incidents. One day when he touched my chair again and wouldn't move his hand when I politely asked him to stop, he refused to let go and again insisted that he wasn't doing anything wrong and that he had the right to do so. It wasn't a big deal, etc. By this point, I'd had enough. He continued to touch me, my chair, and therefore an extension of my person. So I turned my chair around lightning fast, grabbed his stunned hand hard enough, hopefully to bruise it. I've got good upper body and hand grip strength, pulled him down as harshly as I could, and then slapped him in the face as hard. The rest of the class heard the slap and his pained and surprised yelp and they turned to look at us. He screamed and ran over to the professor to whine that I'd grabbed him and hit him. The professor just kind of shrugged and said something along the lines of, well, she told you to stop touching her. He kept whining about it to the professor that I should be punished for assaulting him, etc. only for her and the rest of the class to just ignore him that day and then for the rest of the semester. Mind you, I'm a very chilled person, unless you count childlike excitement glee about life, and I'm never violent, as well as being patient to a fault, so I don't retaliate nearly ever or easily, but frankly, this was self-defense, pure and simple. In any case, the whole class had heard me explain time and time again not to touch me or my chair, and how and why it was inappropriate, and they'd asked if I needed help, but I'd always declined. To me personally, it's not that big of a deal if someone who doesn't know better touches my wheelchair. I just explain why it's wrong. But he was so entitled that he had the right to and wouldn't take no for an answer. That was what made that an actual issue. And I've been much more patient than he deserved. He wasn't very bright, but he wasn't disabled or autistic. I'd asked about the autism in a polite way by sharing that I'm autistic. But even if he were, he'd be high functioning enough for his action to be inexcusable. At the end of class that day, I got a lot of high fives and he kept his distance from me, occasionally glancing over at me fearfully. Good prudence, frankly. The last third or so of the semester, nobody wanted to work with him when we paired up in groups of three to four to work on songs together. People for the most part didn't love working with him before this anyway, but after it became clear that the professor was on my side and not his, It was if he was invisible. Okay, now on the one hand, while I'm happy that the professor was on your side and this kid just got ignored for the rest of the semester, I do have to say, where was your professor before it got to this stage? Like, why are they letting you slap him? Why are they letting it get that far? Like, that should never have been allowed to happen. How can the professor genuinely think, okay, you know what, I see all this going on, but I'm just gonna let it happen and let this student, OP, eventually slap one of my other students and that would be a good resolution a good thing to happen and and that's the way to sort it rather than stopping it at source and saying you can't do this before letting it get violent it's it's like it's it's weird teaching i gotta say like you're just being harassed all semester and they're just leaving you to it really odd look don't get me wrong this guy's clearly a pos and it's good that he got what he deserved in the end but my main takeaway is that professor has to do more here jokes on you he's dead a little context before i start Six years ago, my dad died of terminal brain cancer after two years of treatment. I was nine, turning 10 that summer. My mum was absolutely devastated, but she stayed strong for my brothers and me. Also, we live in France and it's an advanced country, but we live in the backwaters where there are still a lot of misogynists and homophobes. And just to add a little more intrigue, it's a five day bank holiday weekend here in France and it was nearing the end of the workers' shift. Now, my brothers aren't at home much, and I'm at boarding school, so we didn't need our huge car anymore. My mum sold it and replaced it with a brand new Hyundai electric car. It's a lot smaller than what we're used to storage-wise, so she wanted to buy a roof box for it. She went into the shop and asked a female worker where she could find one. The woman called over her male co-workers to help my mum out. She asked them what she asked the woman. Could I have a roof box for my car? They stroll over. The leader smirked as he says, is it for your husband? His friends laughed and so did their female co-worker. But my mum didn't even smile. Instead, she grimaced and said, well, he died six years ago, so I don't think so. 
the guy was mortified. As she told me this story in the car after picking me up from school, I was so proud of her because she was able to make some light of our trauma. Also, she taught a misogynistic idiot a lesson. Well, there we go. Second case of misogyny in this episode. I think this one was probably worse than the first, like trying to get a cheap laugh out of it and then just being hit by that. What a way to bring you back down to earth. Again, massive shout out to your mum though. I mean, you've got to take a leaf out of her book and, and, and start remembering these comebacks for when it sadly inevitably happens to you later in life. But the fact that she can deal with it so well and not kind of like, car away like she's not afraid of of talking about this sort of thing she's not ashamed by it doesn't seem she just wants to you know put people in their place despite the fact that it's obviously a horrible horrible traumatic thing that, that's happened to your family so yeah respect for, for for saying something uncomfortable which i'm sure she didn't enjoy saying to be honest or even like thinking about but this guy and his mates that have, have led her to say it guy asked me why i'm wearing a mask some background information first my city was mostly anti-mask through all of COVID and continues to be. I don't agree with this, but it's a smaller town, so it was easy for people to get away with. I actually wore masks before COVID because I suffer from dermatillomania. Basically, a mental condition where I struggle with peeling off sections of my skin. Oh wow, that sounds terrible. I was shopping at the grocery store with my husband and we were wearing masks. I turn around the corner of an aisle and a man looks at me and asks, Now what are you wearing a mask for? He was loud and clearly looking for an argument, so I just tried to brush it off and say, I have a medical condition. I tried to look for my husband, but he was still in the other aisle. The man then asks, Oh, what kind of medical condition? I'm blown away by the audacity of this guy, but at this point, I hear my husband come up behind me and I suddenly feel courageous or maybe dumb. I pull down my mask and show him the rest of my face. He sees the wounds and some bandages. He looks embarrassed and quietly says, Oh, honey, before walking away. My husband immediately turns me around and hugs me since he worries about my self-esteem, asking if I'm feeling okay and such and what that was about. I just answered, smiling. Well, he asked. I put my mask back up and we continued shopping. I realized after that that I should have just kept my mask on, but it felt good somehow. I also don't know if I was right to call it a medical condition or not, but I kind of panicked in the moment. This was in early 2021, so three years of therapy later, I've been doing much better with my condition. I don't pick as often or as much skin as I used to. Now, I usually don't even wear masks anymore to hide it. I wish I had this kind of confidence back when I had my grandmother say I looked like a meth addict. Uh, well, you know what? I feel like grandmothers just do say stuff like that. Don't take anything from it. They're just all crazy. Uh, no offense. And I know that my grandmother is actually probably watching right now. And I don't mean you, granny. Trust me. Anyway, back to the story now. I feel like, OP, you've done extremely well there. And you know what you're saying about maybe it was bad or you didn't feel comfortable or whatever, that, that it felt good? It should feel good. You completely killed this person phenomenally well and embarrassed him. So well done. And also, you don't have to keep your mask on. I mean, he did ask me to take it off and you did that. So, I mean, you're just doing what he says. Excellent stuff. You want proof I'm injured? Okay, this happened about five years ago. So some details are a bit blurry, but I remember most of what happened. About five years ago, I had some major anger issues caused by other undiagnosed mental issues. I'm okay now and I'm properly medicated. I ended up slamming my door, which caused my mirror to break and slice my left leg open. Stupid mistake, I know. I've learned since then. I ended up going to hospital to get about 48 stitches. I had to miss a couple of days of school because the doctor told me to take it easy for two days. When I finally went back to school, I had crutches because I couldn't put any weight on the injured leg at all. I got an elevator key and I needed people to help me with my books. I kept pain meds with the nurse because again, 48 stitches. She never liked me for some reason. So when I went to get half a pill during lunch, she refused to give it to me. Here is how the exchange went. You don't need any meds, you're fine, the nurse said. No, I do need them. I'm in a lot of pain. Oh, stop faking and go back to lunch. Oh, and leave your crutches here. You don't need them either. Now, I was in a lot of pain, so I was already not in a good mood. This really angered me. Do your dang job and give me my meds, then I'll go back. I have an ungodly amount of stitches in my leg and I'm already upset enough without you being rude. Well, how do I know you're actually injured? You could just have a bandage around your leg. What, you want proof? Yes. So without hesitation, I untied the gauze on my leg, 
removed the gauze pack and showed her my stitched wound. All the color drained from her face and she looked like she was going to throw up. Is this good enough for you? After a moment, she silently unlocked her medicine cabinet and handed me my painkiller bottle, which was literally just extra strength ibuprofen, not opioids. So I've got no idea why she was so protective of it. Take your pill and go back to lunch. I smiled at her as sweetly as possible. Oh, well, I can't go back now. My bandages aren't sterile anymore, so I need to change them. I brought extra bandages just in case, so this wasn't a big deal. She still looked nauseous at this point. So I changed my bandages as slowly as I could, making sure she got a good look at my leg the entire time. I only had to go back to her office twice during my recovery, but each time she didn't hesitate to give me my medication. I saw her when I went to return my elevator key and she avoided eye contact with me. She wasn't working there the following year, luckily. Well, I wonder why. Okay, now go with me on this one, guys. I do feel like there are a lot of people out there that have jobs that they're just not very good at, okay? Uh, who knows why but it just it just probably is the case not naming names here i just think that is the case however when you're a nurse i feel like you know you need to be pretty good at your job or at least know what you're doing you know if, you, if you're a healthcare professional you need to be providing healthcare. that's that's kind of the job description and i don't think you can be bad at doing that Otherwise, it can be potentially very dangerous. Now, I do not understand how this woman had this job in the first place when she is not giving you medication that you have to have. It's just insane. Also, the questions that she's asking you are a joke. First of all, are you actually in pain? How do I know if you're injured? Can you give me proof that you're injured? Etc. 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 All three of those are ridiculous for, for so many reasons. First of all, you don't have to be in pain to have pain medication. If it's like prescribed to you to take three times a day, and you take it three times a day and you're never in pain that's good that means it's doing what it's supposed to be doing right you've been prescribed it for a reason secondly are you actually injured you could just have a bandage around your leg is mental surely she's had some form of documentation before she needs proof that that you are injured right like if you go to hospital and you have 48 stitches your school obviously should know about that. If not, something's gone terribly wrong there in communication. I don't really know why. And then thirdly, saying to somebody, I need to see proof that you have 48 stitches or that you need pain meds is unbelievable, especially when they're coming in on crutches. I mean, look, yeah, some kids do lie about being ill, but I don't think someone would lie to this extent. I mean, maybe they would, but this is just insane. Also, just one final point. Why is she not offering to redress it for you? Well, I'm glad that, I mean, I assume she was eventually fired. The fact that she's not working there the following year leads me to believe so. But after clearly realizing that she was horribly wrong there, surely she at least could have said, oh, you know, what? I'm sorry, let me, let me do that for you, as in do my job. Not just watch you do it yourself and be nauseous. Also, she shouldn't be nauseous. She's a nurse. She should be used to that sort of stuff. Everything about this woman is just so backwards. Don't ask rude and invasive questions and you won't get called out on it. My God, this just happened. I'm still fuming. Some important context. I have a zit the size of Everest tucked in next to the corner of my eye. It's recurring and it will go away soon. It's no big deal. It's just massive. I work reception and a woman came in having made her reservation for the wrong day. No problem. I can at least look up the reservation information. While I'm doing so, she goes, what happened to your eye? A lovely question to ask the person trying to help you. I blink and tell her, it's a pimple. No way. There's no way that's just a pimple. Then I pull the saying out for the first time. I'm shocked you feel comfortable saying something like that to a total stranger. I have genetic cystic acne. But unbelievably, she doubles down. Well, I just, my daughter has acne too. I say nothing. She doesn't really talk to me about it either. I double down. Well, I don't like to talk about it. It got me made fun of when I was younger. Cue the breathy comments about how I, as well as some guys she's texting, are calling her a POS. If that's what you got from my very calm and decently polite responses, maybe you have some introspection to do. Enjoy your visit, and I hope you think twice before making comments about someone's appearance. Now, fortunately, while the cystic acne is indeed real and genetic, I wasn't ever picked on for it. At least, not until I reached adulthood, for some reason. You know what? I cannot actually believe that this woman has said, I, I can't believe it. My daughter has acne too. And for some reason, she doesn't like talking about it either. Yet, she's asking a total stranger about her acne. It's just, obviously, she's just so dumb. 
so, so dumb. And yes, I agree. You have a lot of introspection to do. Um, but, but fair play to UOP again for just saying, you know what, I'm not dealing with this. Just because I'm here to help you out and I know I'm, I'm working in reception, you're a customer, whatever. I'm not going to sit here and take that from you. You've got to know that this is, a, this, is a, this is just too far. You can't be asking this sort of stuff. And, you know, if you are this woman and you're thinking, mm, why is everyone calling me a POS? It's probably because you are. That is the logical answer to that. Karen said, boys will be boys. So I return the favor. More than 20 years ago, when me and my sisters were still in elementary, our mum took us to a shopping mall for clothes and groceries. A major supermarket was attached to the mall. After everything was over, we stopped by the bookstore where us kids picked whatever books we wanted while she was picking educational books for both of us. The bookstore was also selling some physical discs for various softwares, including games. While both of us were looking into the games we wanted, a little boy of our age came next to us, opened up one of the discs, and poked my sister in the eye. My sister immediately started to cry her eyes out, and my mum rushed over to see what was happening. She scolded the little boy after hearing what happened, to which he got upset and went to grab his Karen of a mother. Karen comes over and demands to know who yelled at her son. The two ladies began to get into a shouting match. My mum argued the kids had no reason to hurt my sister like that and should be taught better. But Karen argued, boys will be boys and that he doesn't know any better. She asked my mum, why are you overreacting? I decided enough was enough. I did a frontal kick on the kid as hard as I can, making him fall on his butt. I saw there was a nice footprint imprinted on his shirt. He began to let out the most annoying cry I've ever heard. The Karen quickly rushed over to her little turd and began shouting at me. I looked her in the eye and said, boys will be boys. Why are you overreacting? She tried to argue more. But her friend, or maybe her sister, held her back and ushered her out of the store. We went to get burgers and fries afterwards, but my mum also lectured me about how violence isn't the answer. Me being a little sprouty elementary kid didn't care and rode that hype train for weeks. You know what? I actually disagree with your mum. Sometimes I feel like violence has to be the answer, otherwise people don't learn lessons, right? And, and take that with, with a lot of context and the, the vast majority of the time, it's not the right thing to do. But I feel like once in a blue moon, sometimes that has to be done. Otherwise, no one's ever going to learn. Like there are very, very few cases, very, very few where violence should be the first response. Very, very few. But in a situation like this, where this woman is so oblivious to how heinous her children are being, spouting terrible excuses like boys will be boys. And yeah, I can imagine that this thing will continue to happen again and again because her kids aren't being parented correctly. They're not learning what's right and wrong. Perhaps this flying kick, which let's be honest, probably didn't hurt that much, will actually sort her kids out and will stop them from doing stuff like this in the future. Like it's educational. If a flying kick could ever be educational, this is it. I didn't look pretty enough four hours after my mum died. This happened a really long time ago now but I've never seen anyone run away from a situation quite so quickly. And sometimes I do wonder what the guy thought or if he learned his lesson. So my mum had been terminal and was in hospice care in our home. We knew time was limited. However, when I'm upset, the first thing to go to hell is my sleep schedule. I slept two hours that night and I hadn't been getting much more sleep than that for the few weeks preceding this. But she ended up passing slightly before four the morning that this took place. So after she passed, I decided I needed caffeine to get through the day. So when the nearest gas station opened up at 8 a.m., I headed over there for some energy drinks. I likely did look a bit of a mess. It is easy to tell when I'm tired and I was wearing college merch that was much bigger than my usual size. I get out of my car and I start shuffling through my clothes. I couldn't remember which gigantic pocket I'd put my wallet in. While I did that, this man pulls up to a pump in a very shiny car. I don't remember what he looked like beyond that he looked a bit like a very put together game show host. This man turns to me. He was 20 feet away, so this was all said loudly and says, it's a shame someone so pretty can't improve everyone's day with a smile. I burst out crying, ugly crying with the sobbing mouth thing and shaking. I just went from standing there hoping I hadn't left my wallet at home to bawling in a mostly empty parking lot. I did manage to yell something like, I'm sorry I'm not freaking pretty enough for you when my mum died four hours ago. The dude turned on his heels and left. Didn't pump gas, didn't go inside for coffee, didn't apologize, just got in his car and left. I was saved from standing in the parking lot sobbing by a woman who I think was jogging and heard what the man and I said to each other 
and the employee of the gas station, who were both very kind. Ah, oh, man, there we go. I mean, look, that is obviously the deepest story that we've we've had so far. Goodness me, I just got to say off the bat, OP, I'm so sorry to hear about your situation and, and your parents passing, but also just to be in this spot and have someone do this to you. Yeah, absolutely insane. Like, to be fair to the guy, maybe he had good intentions, but you really shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. You shouldn't be putting your nose in someone else's business, especially when they have the expression that I'm sure you had, which was just, you know, being absolutely distraught. It's past the point of not smiling. Surely you look just very, very upset. I mean, from an outlooker looking in, surely you knew that, that something had gone wrong there. You weren't just being sad or like not smiling. I don't know. I get the feeling he came in with like a positive attitude, but ultimately, yeah, terrible thing to do. Don't assume things about other people. And I hope that this guy learned his lesson. Although I say that, a good man would have just apologized and said, I'm so sorry. I, I really had good intentions. I just want people to be positive. It's my bad. I I'm so sorry for your loss and that I did that. That's my fault. But actually, no, he ran away, didn't he? He ran away like a little coward. So I take it all back. He's just a disgraceful man. There we go. I will say, though, that the people that helped you in that situation, that has restored my faith in humanity. But once again, OP, I'm so sorry. Let's move on. I was getting tampons, officer. So I got pulled over one night coming back from Walmart. I definitely deserved the ticket for speeding, but the cop was asking for too much information. It was late, I was cramping. I just wanted to be home so I could stop bleeding in my pants and eat my cookies. Of course, the typical question. Do you know how fast you were going? Ah, <sighs> yes, sir, 65. Where are you coming from? Okay, fair question, I guess. It is 12 a.m. Walmart officer. What were you getting at Walmart? Um, okay, why do you need to know that? I just want to get home, my guy. But since you asked, I was getting tampons. Do you want to see them? His eyes got wide and he walked away without saying a word. He came back to give me my ticket and he couldn't make eye contact. Most expensive box of tampons I have ever bought. However, the look on that guy's face was priceless. Now, <laughs> I agree with you, OP. There's, there's questions that as a police officer, you are obviously allowed to ask and expected to ask. Uh, the one about, do you know how fast you're going? That's a standard question. And I think that is, is a reasonable one. But asking what you were buying at a shop surely is just not relevant information. Like, at all. Why would an officer ever need to know that? To be honest, I think he should have just not given you the ticket there. Just through embarrassment. Just held his hands up and said, wow. Uh, I've been completely done there. I'm not going to ticket you. There you go. Uh, enjoy your day. But no, he still gave you a ticket. What a little rat. Yeah, I get it. it's the law, but come on. You, you effed up there. You deserve some form of karma, surely. My kid can die if I don't. I was waiting to check in at the dentist today and some old lady started humphing and such. We we're in Florida and I'm wearing a mask. Unusual, I guess, but most people just mind their own business and leave me alone. There's a few, however, who are pains about it. She looked at me and asked why I was wearing that thing on my face. Everyone knows that the virus is gone. Why am I out and about if I'm that scared? Now, I have breast cancer and I'm not feeling great today. Mine's not terrible considering. My son, though, also has cancer and his is bad. Grade four brain cancer. Oh my goodness me, OP, I'm so sorry to hear that. I just looked at her and said, my oncologist says cancer patients need to be careful about dental care. Plus, my kid can die if I don't. She turned sheet white and left me alone the rest of the time we were in the waiting room together. I'm pretty sure the dental hygienist who came out to get me was purposely a bit louder than normal, asking about how my son was doing. Now, this is pretty similar, I think, to the third post we had in this episode. Once again, why are you sticking your nose in someone else's business when you just don't need to be doing it? And also, what is wrong with wearing a mask? If I see someone wearing a mask out and about these days, I say fair play to them, thank you. Either you are ill and you're protecting the rest of the population from getting your illness, or you don't want to get ill yourself. Both great things. Why is that a negative thing? Oh, COVID is done now? Well, first of all, it isn't. Like my granny had COVID a couple of weeks ago uh, and the only reason she didn't have it that badly is because she's still getting vaccinated. And secondly, who cares? Let people wear masks. My wife is dead. When my son was born, I was a stay-at-home dad for the first year of his life. We also lived in New York City and I loved taking him out into the city to do things. Nearly every subway ride though, I'd have some kind of encounter with a woman or group of women, usually boomers, who would say some variation of giving mum the day off. 
or so nice to see dad's babysitting once in a while now first off it's not possible to babysit your own kid that's called parenting but second i was the primary caregiver Mum was at work i stayed home with the boy it got old real fast but i found a very nice trick that shut these old biddies down real quick anytime someone would ask if i was babysitting or giving mum the day off my face would fall I'd get real quiet and after taking a moment to compose myself i'd say something like my wife died during childbirth or my wife is currently undergoing radiation treatment for stage 4 cancer she's at a clinic in california i haven't seen her in six months or my favorite his mum abandoned us when he was just six weeks old she'd been using drugs pretty heavily while she was pregnant and so he was born addicted I didn't hear from his mother for months after she left until one day I found out she'd overdosed and died. This little guy is all I've got left of her. But we carry on best we can. That shuts them up real quick. Now I will say that perhaps given the the stories we've read earlier in this episode, this might not be like the best thing to do. I think like lying about people dying in your family is maybe a little bit too much, but I completely understand why you did it, OP. And it did have the desired effect. And again, like you don't have to deal or you shouldn't have to deal with this complete and utter sexism every single day when you're just being a good dad. So if that's the best way that you thought about, you know, dealing with people like this, then I hold my hands up. There you go. I mean, if it does happen every single day, then that must get unbelievably annoying. I mean, I will say that saying that his mum abandoned us when he was just six weeks old, she'd been using drugs pretty heavily. And so he was born addicted. I mean, imagine hearing that. Like you've just said... Oh, it's so nice to see a man doing the job for once, babysitting. And then you hear the guy say that. You've got to be questioning your life at that point. Uh, yeah, it's had the desired effect. Comment on my butt at work. Let me make this uncomfortable for us both. I was working as a front end cashier for a local grocery store. It was around the time of my lunch break. So my line was closed off after this last customer. Grizzled, 60, 70 year old bearded guy. I am in my early 20s, a feminine cashier. As I finish ringing up his purchases and he goes to slide his card, the card machine doesn't work. I tell him to keep swiping until it beeps. We were mid-changed to a new sales system, so this was a common occurrence. I bend under my till to clean and organize while he's sliding his card. As I'm bent over, his card dings. Sweet, let's wrap this up so I can go eat. Instead, oh, I liked it when you did that. I'm still under the till. I roll my eyes. And then inspiration strikes. Petty, petty inspiration. I come up. Did what, sir? When you bent over, it worked. I had a confused face. Why? Well, it liked when you bent over. Why would it like that I bent over? It's a boy card. Boys like it when girls bend over. Sorry, I've got to say, this is the creepiest dude I've ever seen on Reddit. What? But why? I ask again. Well, they just do. At this point, I'm gleeful on the inside. But why? I don't understand. The old man is getting flustered. His face gets red. He mumbles. Mom, um, you're making me a little uncomfortable. I drop the dumb act. I lean forward across the check stand and look right into his eyes. And how do you think I feel when a man makes an unwanted comment on my backside while I'm at work? He is 20 shades of red, stammering. I, uh, I meant no disrespect. It was supposed to be a compliment. I put on a very stern face. Well, it was disrespectful. Please don't comment on women's bodies when they work. I'm so sorry. It won't happen again. He collects his bag and leaves without another word. Gleeful vindication. Good. Now maybe you won't go and harass other people at their freaking jobs. Well, yeah, uh, creepiest guy ever. Literally the creepiest guy ever. Well done, OP, for not just being quiet. I mean, it must be pretty like horribly uncomfortable in situations like this. And you just want to stay quiet and just say, OK, fine, I'll ring you up. Go, leave the store. But no, you did the right thing. I mean, fair play. It's very brave to do that. Courageous. Uh, I can't even imagine being in this situation. Just try and do your job and getting harassed by people 50 years older than you. I mean, by the way, brother, you got no chance anyway. What are you doing? Go home to your old people's home and just sit in your chair and do the Sudoku, my friend. And by the way, I quite like Sudokus. So that's not 
a slight on people that do Sudokus, but it is a slight on creeps. I served my sister-in-law a child's plate after she broke multiple heirloom china plates. I caught her breaking them on camera. My husband and I have family dinners at our house every month or so with our family. I have some sets of fine china that I like to switch out between the seasons that I've inherited from my grandmother. When we have our get-togethers, I serve dinner on these plates. My mother-in-law compliments them every time. My sister-in-law, however, has made comments to me that they're not her style. I honestly didn't think twice about her comments up until this past February, when one of my plates was put in the sink, broken. I chalked it up to an accident. In April, we had another dinner. This time, my sister-in-law was carrying both her and her boyfriend's plates to the sink and accidentally dropped them both. Again, no biggie at all. In May, she broke two more plates, and in June, she broke a plate and a cup. At this point, I was catching on. I brought up these concerns to my husband, and he brushed them off as accidents. I told my mum, and she said that she thought that my sister-in-law was doing it on purpose, and she got me a camera to put in the dining room. In July, we had dinner, and I had an opportunity arise. My mother-in-law, sister-in-law, and her boyfriend joined us for dinner. While our plates were still on the table, my mother-in-law asked how my plants were doing, and I said I'd show her. I told my husband to follow us outside so he could show her the plant that he's growing, leaving my sister-in-law alone with her boyfriend. When we came back inside, five minutes later, her plate was broken. When they left, I pulled up the camera footage. I saw her stand up when we walked out, peek around the corner, and then throw the plate on the ground. I kept this video to myself. All I'll say at this point is, are you sure she's not Greek and it's just tradition? I jest. This brings me to this past weekend. We had our family dinner and we were joined by my in-laws, my sister-in-law and her boyfriend, as well as my parents, siblings and niece. I served everyone, saving evil sister-in-law for last. I brought her food out on a child's plate with a sippy cup and got those kids silverware with the plastic handles. She looked at me confused and said, I think you mixed my plates up with your niece's plates. And I said, no. My niece is responsible enough to eat on a grown-up's plate. If you're going to act like a child in my home, I'm going to treat you like a child in my home. She tried to play coy, but I had my iPad ready and I played the video to everyone at the table. She started sobbing. She swiped the kid's plate off the table and stormed out. My in-laws both apologized and offered to pay for a replacement plate, but I told them not to worry about it. Despite this, we still had a nice time. When everyone left, my husband told me I was out of line and cruel. But I told him that this has been happening for months and I've told him it was bothering me multiple times. It's Wednesday, he's still being a little cold to me and I also got a text from my sister-in-law's boyfriend asking me if I'd apologize to her because I really embarrassed her. I sent him the video again and he left me on red. My husband just called me to ask if I was taunting her boyfriend because his sister called him crying that I was. Now, somebody has asked in the comments down below, inquiring minds need to know why would she break your plates? Because she doesn't like to eat off something that's not her style? Yeah, I agree. That is one of the weirdest things I've ever heard. How can you have a style of plate that you like or dislike at someone else's house? Opie replied, I would like to know too. I'll probably never get a straight answer though. My husband apologized and now we're bouncing back and forth off of the whys and we're kind of circling around to the boyfriend. My in-laws say that's when they've noticed a behavior change. She's gotten into trouble since dating him. They act like teenagers. My husband is saying exactly what I was thinking was happening. He's trying not to blame or pin anything on her because she has been behaving differently over the past few months. She got caught shoplifting and her boyfriend also got caught stealing and went to jail. No diagnosis that I've ever known of, but the family is now saying there could be a deeper issue or possibly a substance issue. Someone else also commented, I'm glad that your husband apologized. What made him come around, if I may ask? OP said, my mother-in-law, at least I'm assuming. She texted me that they were on the phone when he was on his way home. That's my bet. I really want to talk to him about all of this, but I don't want to overwhelm him, especially because he's been a little distant. I think the whole thing is overwhelming for him. He told me his sister called him four times. I'm keeping it low key for now, but I'm going to try and get some answers about the plate breaking. All right, then there we go. Uh, Quite a long story. The good thing about r slash traumatize them back is that you do get some short fun posts. I don't know if fun's the best word there, but you know, snappy little ones that you don't have to concentrate on too much. And then you get some longer, more in-depth ones like this. I just want to know what is wrong with the plates. 
I really do. How can the style of a play have that much of an effect on someone's life to the extent that they want to break them? I mean, absolutely insane. Shout out your mother-in-law, by the way. Like, what a goat saying, you know what? I know what's going on here. Here's a secret camera. Set it up. Let's watch this back together. Oh, actually, it was your mum, wasn't it? But still, I feel like your mum and your mother-in-law both did well here. Your sister-in-law, less so. I do kind of feel like your husband, though, took a lot of convincing here when she'd broken six or seven pieces of heirloom china, yet apparently, according to him, you're in the wrong for embarrassing her. Where's the logic there, my friend? I mean, yes, it's good that he's come around, but it should not have taken him that long. Mother tries to spank teenager and regrets it. I'm well into being an adult today, and this is a story of how I stopped my mother from ever spanking me again. My mother has always been fond of physical punishment. She's a pusher, slapper, hit with random objecter, and a spanker. I got spanked a lot for things I did and things that she perceived I did. She spanked me well into being a teenager as well. I was 16 or 17 at the time and my wet towel from showering was on my bed. My mother always lost her mind over not hanging a towel properly. And frankly, this was a mistake I made often. She came in while I was dressing, saw the towel, and she immediately grabbed and spun me to start spanking. I'll never know what devil took over, but it was a devil that had been needed much sooner in my life. Instead of crying out in pain, I said... And I can't quite believe I'm about to do this, guys. But I will. And I'm going to give it my all here. Oh. Oh. She was confused and asked, What sort of smart-ass response was that? My response was, Well, after so many spankings, I was wondering when I would start to enjoy it. She looked horrified, left my room, and I called down the hallway, Come back. We can take our relationship to the next level. I was never spanked again. I cannot believe I've just read that. That is obviously going to be the conclusion of this episode immediately. Well, despite the fact that I just actually cannot believe what I've just done there. Um, and I'm, I'm really sorry if any family members are, are watching this or listening to this. Uh, it's probably my lowest moment in my life so far. Uh, that is the perfect example of r slash traumatize them back. Your mum now, surely, is living with that trauma. In the back of her mind, yes, she might have thought you were joking long term, but she was always going to have those lingering doubts. Did my son enjoy sexually me spanking him? Makes you think really, really does. Stalk my daughters. I'll stalk you back. This was a few years ago. I think 2018, 19, pre-COVID at any rate. So I'm a bit fuzzy on ages, but I think my sister and I, I am a woman, by the way, were 30 or 31 and 21 or 22 respectively, But basically, we were followed by a strange man. We were on holiday at the time and we'd left our mum in a pub to go and grab a couple of cute things from a shop and to go play with a local stray cat who lived at one of the squares. She's since been adopted by a family. It's a place we've been going to since we were both babies, so we know our way around blindfolded and we generally feel safe in the area that we were in. Now, on our walk back to the pub, we realized we were being followed by somebody we didn't know. He wasn't being subtle about it. So we walked a different way to try and throw him off before going back to our mum. As you may imagine, this was extremely alarming to us, particularly because we were in a foreign country. Our friend who owned the pub offered to call the police on the guy since he was still obviously loitering around the corner. My mum though had a different approach. She was a formidable woman who didn't take any nonsense and was fiercely protective of her daughters. If someone like a Karen tried to start an argument with her, as once happened on a flight, They would quickly regret it because she always won. She once quit her job after one too many insults from her boss, knowing her boss couldn't function without her and would come begging her to come back. And she was right. So my mum decided to stalk this strange man back. My sister and I decided to follow along because it sounded intriguing. We watched as he tried to hide behind trees. It did not work. And eventually got so uncomfortable with my mum's relentless pursuit that he fled across the main road and she pursued him even then until he was finally gone from our sights that is amazing i mean this is just brilliant it's absolutely comical in my mind it just i just want to see this happen this has to be turned into some sort of skit or something or some sort of episode on a comedy show i mean it's just so good what a great way to just completely unnerve someone and hopefully make this man realize that what he's doing is so creepy i mean it is also illegal but just mainly just so weird like what is going on your mum by the way absolutely legendary i hope she haunts this man for a very long time and to be honest i mean might as well keep up the stalking 
It's so funny. Deceased father's girlfriend is going down. So this will be a developing story over the next few months. Just getting started. My father passed away three weeks ago. He was a hard worker, into real estate and a man of means. He has seven properties, five cars and liquid cash. His girlfriend that chased him down nine years ago was his carer until death. In the last two to three years, she began to isolate my father from his four kids. She'd attempt to keep us out of the home and stand at the door and say he was sick. We would push our way in and he never rejected us. I think we all know what she's trying to do here. November 4th last year, I went out of the blue to his house and he was lying there dying. I took a video. He was septic and wouldn't have made it through the night if I hadn't found him. I sent him to the hospital. He went back again a week later and was placed on hospice. This female dog, I've since found out, deleted my number from his phone. She then got him a new phone about two weeks before he died to confuse him so he wouldn't know how to use it. He asked my siblings and son for my number three times to call me before death and he never called. Oh my gosh. I suspect that she kept him from calling. I must fill in this blank. She drove a wedge between us and talked to me like a dog from November to December when I went no contact. I sent a letter expressing my hurt and that I loved him. She presented an electronic will, leaving her everything. Now, e-wills are not valid in my state. She sent a text from his phone to hers back in January, stating that he was leaving her two homes. It was in broken English, so I know it was her. Dad doesn't even text. He didn't know how. So she is losing everything. Her car, the house they shared, everything. I'm even thinking of suing her for mental and emotional abuse of my dad. The car he bought for her is in his name. That's gone. Oh, and she also ranted over his casket at his children and grandchildren all on video. I'm going to ruin her. Wow. Also, a quick update. We're getting temporary orders of administration over the estate and filing eviction tomorrow. And we confiscate vehicles this Sunday with Sheriff Escort winning. Well, that is amazing to hear. Wow. I mean, the ending for that is great. Uh, that is great to see that, that she's, you know, losing everything. It's just a terrible, terrible case, isn't it? It's a terrible story. Ultimately, though, I do feel like, is there not some form of like attempted murder charge here that you could be going for? I know you probably don't want to do this and it's horribly morbid and it's so sad and just very, very, you know, distressing for you and the family. But if you found your dad pretty much dying in front of you, well, you said dying, like he was septic. And it's because of her lack of looking after him. That's the reason why he's in that position. It has to be. Then is there not a, a charge or a potential case for attempted murder there? I don't know. What you've got so far, the, the temporary orders of administration over the estate, the fact that she's going to be in a much worse place after your dad's death than she was before, despite the fact that, yeah, she clearly was just going for all his money and, and property in the first place. I think there's more, there's more you could do here. I don't know. It's up to you, but I do feel like there's more that could be done. Let me know in the comments down below. It's attempted murder not on the cards here. I'm not sure. Let me know. Annoying middle school attendance lady. Years ago, I called the middle school attendance office to have my two boys sent to the office so I could take them out of school for a family emergency. The attendance lady was not happy about this and went on a rant about how I should have sent a note with them a day or two in advance and then she would have had them in the office. Now she has to send a student to each of their rooms to get them and this could take 30 minutes. It's a very old building with no intercoms to each room. Sir, do you understand what an inconvenience it is for me to stop my students from doing an assigned task and have them go and get your children? I was trying to interject, but she wasn't having it. She continued on and on about how all of the protocols are in the student handbook if I would have just taken the time to read it at the beginning of the year. She then finally stopped long enough for me to speak. Mom, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry I didn't send a note with the boys. Now, unfortunately, their grandfather didn't give me advance notice that he was going to have a heart attack this morning. The surgeon performing his open heart surgery didn't give us any advance notice either. We have to leave town immediately. The stuttering and awkwardness was amazing. Honestly, it was hysterical and a great stress reducer while he was in surgery. My dad loves that story. Oh, so he survived. That is even better. Yeah, the word that springs to mind here is just jobs worth. As I said, I'm very happy that, that your granddad wasn't actually dead. I thought he was, and then I thought it was going to be an extremely sarcastic response from your dad, something along the lines of, well, 
Unfortunately, we didn't get advance notice that my dad was about to die, but at least he's still alive and hopefully he could even laugh at this story. Absolutely insane. I mean, is it that hard to go and get students out of a classroom? Also, just send an email. That's what we did at my school. The teachers caught an email and they were on their computers anyway. Or yeah, just send a kid around to go and get them. It's not that hard. And in familial emergencies like this, obviously it has to be done. You just haven't had the right D yet. So I, a 19 year old woman, only date femme folks. Sexual tastes are a bit broader. Much of the support of most of my family and all of my friends. The friends of my friends, not so much. One of those friends, unfortunately, had a Klingon in their circle. A jerk will call Bill. Bill has certain views on relationships and women and is not very happy with queer people. He likes to make small comments on the fact that I only date women and even more so that I'm dating two people. Oh, the horror. And only one is a woman, the other being a femboy. Now he got a bit drunk one night and his comments were getting a little bit aggressive. I was cuddling with one of my partners and exchanging small kisses, but eventually he said two things that everyone should hate. The classic of, you just haven't had the right D yet, as well as a new one I'd never heard. You just need to try it once. I volunteer. Oh my gosh. My partner tries to stop me because she could see I was getting mad, but it was too late. Someone told me that once, I said. Then he R-worded me so I could try it once. Now I can't trust anyone who presents masculine like you. He got very defensive over this, acting like I was accusing him of something and carrying on. He was promptly asked to leave by the friend he was connected to and i haven't heard or seen him in two months so hurrah yeah i mean this one is just crazy uh, absolutely crazy who in their right mind would ever say something like this it's just insane uh, what are you supposed to even do in response to this i mean you didn't have to say what you did but i'm kind of thankful that you did although it doesn't even seem like he learned from that he just as you say got defensive and then carried on so really i mean did he actually learn from that at all probably not which is mad, but yeah, crazy. Although I guess if you haven't seen him in two months, that is a good thing, but it shouldn't take you having to say something like this to him for him to not be around anymore. Also, I mean, your friend who is his friend who brought him in, in the first place surely should have realized he's just a creepy guy. I mean, like, unless he's just not a good friend in the first place, you should expect your friends to have good friends, I reckon. I mean, it's not up to you, but if they are in your same or, or similar circles, you can't be expecting someone like this to be knocking about. I mean, it's just disgraceful. I mean, you could also argue that, you know, how does Bill not know that he's gay? He just needs a good big D, uh, for want of a better phrase, and it'll it'll magically change him. Has he tried it? No. How can he possibly know? Customer asks, I have cancer. What's wrong with you? So I put my wig on the counter. Back during the mask mandate, I worked in one of the big brand jewelry stores commonly found in shopping malls. On this boring day, it was only me and my assistant manager. We'll call her Lisa, working. In the afternoon, a man, probably in his mid-30s, comes into the store. I do my usual greeting and get ready to work with him when Lisa clears her throat and pulls on her mask a bit. I didn't even realize that the man wasn't wearing a face covering, so I politely offer him a mask so I can help him. Of course, he goes on a rant, saying he knows his rights and the usual mumbo-jumbo we've all heard. I tell him, I'm sorry, but I have a weak immune system and I can't risk getting sick. This earns me a grunt and him snapping at me, I have cancer, what's wrong with you? I give him no answer and take my wig off and drop it on the counter in front of me. He sputters and tries to apologize, saying he didn't know. He then decides to tell my coworker and me, both early 20s females, about his testicular cancer, talking way too much about his naughty bits for our liking. I guess that that was his way of trying to diffuse the awkwardness and shame. I've walked to the other side of the store and my coworker dealt with him. At some point, I heard him say to her, I'd ask what kind of cancer she has, but... Now Lisa and I share a knowing look. I never actually said I had cancer. My hair fell out when I was a kid and never grew back. That's all it is. No sickness, just my immune system being stupid. Oh, wow. Eventually, he buys an engagement ring and scurries away. I've honestly never seen a customer walk out so fast paced. Lisa and I crack up laughing once we thought he was out of hearing range before going back to being bored on a slow day. That is actually phenomenal. I mean, it's a great thing that you don't have cancer, but also the fact that you slightly inferred that you did while not actually saying that you did and him thinking, oh my God, what have I done? 
is so good as well. I think just to clarify what I mean here, I mean like it's it's a good thing that you don't have cancer. I mean, that's obviously a, a flat good thing. But I think it's also a good thing that that you made him think that you did have cancer, despite the fact that you didn't lie about having cancer, which would have been weird. Him him thinking that you have cancer, I think is a good thing and, and should, in theory, although I've said this with like everyone else in this in this video, really, should in theory make him think twice about doing something similar in the future. But I don't know, guys. I mean, I'm just looking through this again. Does he, like he scurries away and is obviously embarrassed. Will he do something like this in the future? I don't know. I also kind of do feel a bit bad for him. Like if he has cancer, then... It's just a terrible thing to have, obviously. So let's let's cut him a little bit of slack. He's probably going through a lot right now. But it doesn't excuse, you know, being really rude. And it also doesn't excuse not wearing a mask. I mean, surely you can still wear a mask when you have cancer. If anything, wouldn't you still want to have a mask on? I mean, more than ever. So you don't get, you know, you're not at risk of, of getting an infection which would make your immune system even weaker, right? Your friendly neighborhood cripple is back. This just happened today and I'm still giddy with glee. Hello, I'm your friendly neighborhood cripple. For those of you just joining us, I, a 50 year old woman, am paralyzed from the bra band down due to a catastrophic illness. It's been almost 10 years since I was paralyzed and I have tons of stories which I share here for your enjoyment. To mitigate my disability and help me get around in the world, I have a power wheelchair and a service dog. I'm not exaggerating at all when I say the trash that comes my way could fill a three month supply of my colostomy bags and then some. For our newcomers, I am the way I am as I grew up in a suburb of NYC, was bullied constantly my entire school life and grew up with an older brother. He and his friends made my life a living heck until I honed my sarcasm, sharpened my tongue and learned to think quickly to give as good as I got. Usually, I ended up turning it around and making it worse for the person who insulted me. In addition to all of this, my husband and I recently moved from our lovely New York adjacent suburb to North Carolina. It's a lower cost of living. I still get excellent medical care. We've got a house that's fully accessible in a lovely neighborhood, etc. People here say things to you in a sickly sweet or very kind voice, but what sounds like a compliment is often an insult. Now that you're all caught up, on to the story. Today we went to Costco. My hair is a gorgeous dark purple, and as my service dog Cap and I are wheeling around, I see a shirt I like. I go to look at said shirt. It was one of those super soft casual cuts in an amazing shade of green. A younger woman, maybe mid thirties, looks at me and nods politely. I smile and nod back and begin checking out the shirt that caught my eye. She's next to me, also checking out the shirt, just in a different color. She says to me, you are so brave to have purple hair. I could never do something like that. In that, oh, bless your heart tone. Oh, no, I replied. What's brave is a woman your age wearing that. A vague gesture to her clothes. What, what's wrong with it? Well, those jeans are definitely a choice. Plus open toed shoes when your feet look like that. I wish I had half your confidence. You'll have a great day. At that point, I decided against the shirt since the shade of green made me look like a shade of corpse that was just not flattering. Not that any shade of corpse is flattering, but this was the least flattering shade of corpse I'd ever seen. Cap and I zoomed off to find my lost husband, leaving her to stare at her perfectly nice jeans and perfectly normal feet in perfectly normal open toed shoes. I wonder what the frick was wrong with them and probably wonder why a woman in her mid thirties shouldn't be wearing perfectly nice jeans with a perfectly nice sweater and perfectly normal open toed shoes. I'll be living rent free in her head for a long, long time. Until next time, because there's always a next time, your friendly neighborhood cripple. Now, just some more info to add. Several people have raised the question if she was actually complimenting me. Sadly friends, she wasn't. Her tone of voice was the one reserved for very stupid dogs very stupid husbands or very ugly babies. That saturine false sweet tone that indicates disdain behind what would otherwise be complimentary words. Like calling your dog brilliant because they started themselves awake by farting and give their butter look like it betrayed them. Now I am guilty of that last one. Peggy does it regularly and everyone it's hilarious. Yeah, that is fair enough. I was kind of thinking, are you sure she's not actually complimenting you? But I guess when you're in real life, when you hear the tone, you would know if someone's being sarcastic. All right, guys, let me know in the comments down below because this is the first time I've ever come across this user. 
And I've got to say, from the style of writing and just the general tone, I love this person and I want to read more stories from them about similar sort of things that have happened. I can't quite believe I've not seen a story from OP before, but I don't think I have. Comment down below. Do you want to see more from this user? Because I reckon, I've not had a look, but I reckon they've got loads and loads of posts that are probably equally as funny as this one. I mean, on this one, just well done. Well done. It's a necessary comment from anyone to ever comment on someone else's appearance or style when they're just strangers. So yeah, you just shut her up instantly. It sounded like you just clapped back right away. And you're so right. It's, it makes it better that she's wearing normal stuff that probably looks pretty nice. Because now she's going to be second guessing probably her entire wardrobe. And then thinking, oh my god, what did she see? What can I not see? Why, why does she say this about my jeans when they're actually completely normal? It's so good. As you said, great phrase rent free grab my booty have fun blowing your nose this one happened just an hour ago i'm still shaking a bit but dang am i proud of myself i was at the wall of marts my first mistake and i was bent over looking at craft stuff this random man late 30s early 40s decided it would be a great idea to grab a fistful of my butts of course the dude does not know i'm a martial artist so i was very surprised when i rabbit punched him square in the nose he grabs his face and starts cussing me out I cock my fist back and shout, and I'll do it again. He scurried off, still cussing up a storm. No, I didn't contact the police. Not my first rodeo, so I know they wouldn't do anything. I did tell a manager I'm familiar with what happened, so they could keep an eye out. Why am I so proud of myself? I didn't cry. I even finished my errands before coming home. I was not going to let a random jerk ruin my day. And there we go. If you weren't sure what r slash traumatized them back was all about, well, now you know. This is brilliant. He assaulted you first. You get to do whatever you want to him afterwards, in my opinion. Yeah, I know, like, legally, you assaulted him back. But is that not self-defense of some sort? I mean, he can't get away with this. And now he's not going to do it again because of you. So you've done amazingly for yourself and for other women that this would probably have happened to in the future. Amazing. How a PE teacher put my sister in the hospital. So this is about my older sister, who I'll be calling Jane for this post. Now, Jane has asthma. She's had it ever since she was a baby and gets it pretty badly. We've had to spend more than one Christmas in the hospital because she had pneumonia and the school was very well aware that she has asthma. She always had an inhaler on her and the front office had a nebulizer for emergencies. And there were multiple doctor notes on file limiting what she could do. She couldn't play a wind instrument in band class. She was allowed to not sing in choir if she was having trouble. And if teachers ever took students outside while the weather was bad, she was allowed to opt out. She was in middle school when this happened, and all of the teachers got the memo except for the PE teacher. Not only did this female dog not believe that Jane had asthma, but she also didn't believe that asthma was real. She thought it was just something that kids come up with so they don't have to exercise. What? All right, I've got to interject here, guys. Now, I would typically say that I cannot believe this, right? This seems unbelievable that a PE teacher, a qualified PE teacher, thinks that asthma isn't real. But maybe there genuinely are PE teachers out there that just like love fitness and exercise so much to the extent that they think that any kid that says they have asthma is actually just making it up. So I guess I'm not saying that this woman necessarily thinks that asthma doesn't exist or hasn't been trained to, to know what asthma is, but maybe she just thinks it's an excuse that kids always use. Okay, let's get back to the story. This caused a few problems and Jane had been sent to the principal's office more than once for trying to opt out of gym class. She wouldn't get in trouble, but being reprimanded in front of the entire class and getting sent to the office is mortifying for a middle schooler, and she was sick of it. Our story takes place in the middle of winter, just before winter break. We live in a cold climate, and our winters get wet and cold, neither of which are great for asthmatic lungs. On this day, the teacher had them running the mile, but instead of having them run laps in the gym, she insisted they go outside and kids would get in trouble for taking their coats because they had to be in uniform. Jane tells the teacher she can't run outside in this weather, and the teacher tells her that if she refuses to run, then she'll be sent to the office. Now, if you remember, middle schoolers' sense of self-preservation is non-existent, and Jane has balls so big that they impair her walking, so she decided enough was enough. This school had a track that was a quarter mile long, but for whatever reason, the teachers never had kids run the mile on it. 
Instead, they had the kids run around the block that the school was on twice, while the teacher stood at the starting point with a stopwatch. What Jane knew, and the teacher didn't, was that at the same time Jane had gym class, our mum would go to kindergarten to pick up our younger sister. She'd seen Jane running the mile on nice days earlier in the year and gave her a little honk and a wave. So imagine, if you will, my mother, a CNA, going to pick up her baby, only to spot her eldest daughter running around outside with no coat on in the middle of winter, struggling not to slip on ice in certain spots. Mum was annoyed. She pulled up next to Jane to ask what the heck she was doing. And Jane told her through chattering teeth that the teacher was forcing her to run the mile outside with the other girls. Mum told Jane to get into the car and drove around to the front entrance to rush her into the office, demanding they call an ambulance and get her a nebulizer for a breathing treatment and something to warm her up and get her circulation back as she was literally turning blue. Jane was hospitalized. The school had to pay for the ambulance ride, pay for the nebulizer medication and pay for the hospital stay. Mum chewed out the principal and the teacher. Then the doctor did the same. The teacher was suspended and put under review, but for whatever reason, she didn't get fired. However, she did learn not to ignore doctor's notes in kids' files. And there wasn't another instant like that in the 12 years it took for all of our siblings to finish middle school. And Jane continues to have the largest balls I've ever seen. Why is it always PE teachers, guys? That's my question. You just hear about them a lot. Everyone's had one bad PE teacher who just forces kids to do things that they don't want to do just for no real reason. And I feel like I've seen at least two or three stories like this or similar to this over the years. Now, yes, not necessarily have they had this level of revenge, which was excellent to see. But, you know, on like entitled parents or entitled people, you, you hear about teachers like this, PE teachers, to be precise. It's pretty crazy that she wasn't fired, by the way. Like you said at the end there that she did learn not to ignore doctor's notes in kids' files. Is that not the number one thing to, to like do? as any teacher, is read those files and know exactly what is in them. Surely. Like, yes, the point is to educate, but first and foremost, it's to keep the child alive, isn't it? Like, when they're in your company, you are their carer. That's insane. <laughs> but yeah, shout out Jane for saying, you know what, I'm done with this. I'm just I'm just not doing this again. And um, shout out to your mum as well. You've lost weight. You look great. Slight backstory. About seven years ago, I was forcibly moved out by my father. And after my mother tried to guilt trip me into dropping the associated court case, we went no contact for a while. She and I are on good terms now, but it took a while for us to get comfortable meeting up again. And this interaction occurred during our first meetup after that point. Because of how much this had affected my life, I'd been between jobs for a while and was severely struggling with the poverty of very abruptly having to fend for myself on top of the mental issues caused by the incident. Suffice to say, I was really struggling to have regular meals and was definitely not at 100%. It had been close to a year since she'd last seen me. And due to this intense poverty, I'd naturally lost close to 30 kilograms, 66 pounds since then. I was slightly overweight before and was now just slightly underweight. Don't worry, I wasn't skin and bones. My mum was trying to be friendly and I'm sure she did sincerely mean it as a compliment when she said, you've lost weight, you look great as she's also struggled with her weight a bit. However, I was still quite bitter and uncomfortable with seeing her again after the start she took, and it wasn't exactly intentional weight loss. So I looked her in the eyes and said, thank you. It's from the malnutrition since I can't afford to eat properly. Guys, she went freaking silent. I don't think she looked me in the eye for the rest of the meetup. I would never be so bluntly rude to her now since we're on good terms but she really needed the reminder of how bad my life had become because of the incident. At least she bought me a F ton of groceries afterwards because of it. So I had some proper food again for a while. Yeah, I mean, that's a good thing, I guess, but she can't just like buy some groceries for you in the the short term. And that makes up for everything that's happened in the long term. I don't know what the incident was. Obviously, we don't know what forcibly moved out by your father means. But yeah, depending on the age this was or what happened, I mean, who knows if it's legal or not. But yeah, losing close to 30 kilograms by not being able to get, you know, the sufficient food that you need, whether that's the the quantity or quality, whatever, or other stuff, you know, from from the emotional abuse, perhaps, of of what happened. 30 kilograms is, is nuts given you were slightly overweight before. Wow. Like, it's not as if you were, you know, 200 kg and lost 30 and you're still overweight. Yeah, mental. But I'm I'm glad that she now probably realizes 
what has happened to you, but then surely she should have realized that anyway. Shouting, I'm 15, you pedo, at every guy who harasses me on behalf of younger me. I just found this sub and wow, I love it. I thought I'd share something I've been doing for a few years, which I think this sub will appreciate. I used to get harassed as a young teen, a heck of a lot because I dressed alts and therefore men think you're not a person, but a walking goth sex doll. I also worked in the biggest alt market in my city and we would get so many guys in there just to harass young girls or try to manipulate them. I would try to be a cool aunt figure to these girls and guide them, showing them self-defense, etc. But honestly, the problem seemed to be getting worse and worse. One day, after I'd had to deal with a 14-year-old crying on me because a stranger said he was gonna finish in her hair, I was walking home from work and some guy started shouting the exact same thing at me. Now, I'm pretty lucky in that I don't look much older than I did at 14 or 15. People already said I looked 18. And in that moment, I had a wonderful idea. I turned around and screamed, I'm 15, you freaking pedo. The friend I was with got the memo and joined in screaming pedo at them. At that point, we'd been walking through the busiest square in the city. Pretty soon other people started paying attention to what we were screaming and joined in till there must have been 20 plus people shouting at the guy with easily 200 others staring. I've never seen someone poop it so quick. It was absolutely hilarious to see him go from feeling so big and powerful to so scared so quickly. He legged it off and dived into a taxi clearly scared that if he stayed, an angry mob would form around him. It was brilliant. I still do it to this day when I get harassed, if there's enough people around for it to work, and some of my friends have joined in too. Hopefully before too long, the message will spread around them and they'll all become too scared to harass anyone. Well, you know what, OP? I actually think you're doing the right thing here. Yes, obviously they're not pedos because you're over the age of 18, but they don't know how old you are. So yeah, they're running away because they have no idea and, and for all for all they know you could be under the age of 18 and what if you were under the age of 18 but didn't say anything you know it'd be terrible so yeah again kind of like the first story you've stopped this person from doing this again in the future so yes although you're telling a white lie it's for the good of humanity have you ever sucked a d there was a guy in my small animal care class back in high school who would always ask questions about my asexuality in a condescending tone you know the ones how do you know you're asexual if you've never had sex? Are you sure you just haven't met the one yet? How can you be dating, insert my partner's name here, without sex? So you're just fine with being a virgin forever? Almost every day while I sat with our class chickens, I was interviewed on what I do with my parts. His favorite of the questions was, how can you be so sure you're asexual if you haven't had sex? I tried to explain to him multiple times that I didn't need to have sex to know that I was asexual, that it's a thing you feel, or in our case, don't feel, like how someone would know how they felt about being with men versus women or anyone in between. I used all the analogies I could think of and he just wouldn't stop. One day, I had enough. Without thinking, I yelled, have you ever sucked a D, Mike? I've never seen any person so shocked, like he'd just been told something that would forever change his trajectory of life. What? What? Have you ever had homosexual intercourse with a male? N no. Well, then how can you be sure you're straight then? Huh, Mike? Stammering, he repeatedly insisted it was because he felt such a strong attraction to ladies that there was no possible way he could be gay. Every single time, though, I asked him again how he was so sure. Struggling not to laugh, my friend was trying to get me to lower my voice. Look, Mike, now the chickens are scared. You made me scare the chickens. Get back to me when you've sucked a D, Michael. Naturally, I got in trouble, but my teacher was chill and it was nothing more than a good scolding and a two-week ban from sitting with the chickens. I honestly think I should have gotten in more trouble. I should have controlled my temper. Well, there's no going back in time, I guess. For the remaining two months that we shared class together, he never asked me how I could be so confidently asexual. Maybe he learned something that day. Maybe he was scared of incurring my wrath once again. We may never know. I still haven't gotten any word that he sucked a D yet though. All right, and here is some chicken tax up on screen right now. Um, I don't think I've ever seen chicken tax before on Reddit, but I will say the chickens look pretty lovely. Um, especially like the white one. Is that racist? <laughs> it wasn't meant to be, and it obviously isn't, but I just think the white one looks cute. Not that the, not that the black one doesn't. <laughs> Could this stay in? Yes, because it's not racist. It's just, it's just, it's just unfortunate that I've said that. 
there we go guys i hope you don't take offense to that <laughs> just just a joke well it's not a joke I, I don't i mean it i thought the white one looks cool anyway uh yeah let's just move on tell the entire class about my depression while i'm in the mental hospital hope you don't mind me emailing the entire staff about your aa meetings i have severe clinical depression and i've been struggling with it for years the teachers are always made aware of my hospital admissions so they can be more lenient on late work after i get back which i've never really had a problem with now there was this math teacher i had Let's call her Mrs. R. My dad is a recovering alcoholic and goes to AA regularly, which I'm very proud of him for. When he went to a parent-teacher conference with her for the first time, he told me in the car that he remembered her from AA and was surprised she got a job since she relapsed constantly. Now, I didn't care much about it since everyone has their problems and just decided to forget about him saying it. Now, I had to be hospitalized due to an unalive attempt. It was for about three weeks and during that time, I was doing math work to keep up with her class. When I came back, I realized that everyone acted very off when they talked to me. I was fairly confused, so I asked one of my friends what happened when I was gone. Apparently, a kid had openly asked why I was gone for most of the year without any repercussions, and Mrs. R decided it was appropriate to go on a rant about how I was depressed and mentally ill and that she hated how I was coddled by the school board. She also stated that if I was her child, she would beat the depression out of me. I was royally annoyed at the fact that she did that and thought it was a good thing to do to a kid that at that point was in middle school and was being bullied left and right. In a rage, I sent a mass email to the staff, stating that she was seen in AA and how uncomfortable I felt with an alcoholic teaching me stuff. Following this, she was terminated because not even the administration knew about her addiction and thought that it wasn't safe for her to be around children. Now, just want to make sure, um, OP, that, that you saying following this, she was terminated. Does that mean she was shot and killed? I hope it, I hope it does. I fear it doesn't, but yeah, I feel like that is the only reasonable outcome here is that she was shot on sight because the things that she's doing here are a disgrace. And yeah, it's kind of weird that her, her school wouldn't know about her, her alcoholism and her alcoholic past, but maybe she just hid it. I mean, that's I'm sure what happened, um, which is crazy to, to be a, a, an alcoholic that isn't, you know, isn't recovered and is still, well, relapsing constantly, according to your, your dad. But yeah having that person around children is, is is crazy yeah you did the right thing once again to be honest it doesn't really matter that she is an alcoholic or goes to aa meetings or relapses whatever like the fact that she's disclosing this to your or to her class your classmates and then saying all this stuff that she said like it is absolutely ridiculous she hated how you were coddled by the school board and that if, if you were her child, she would beat the depression out of you. That That's absolutely insane. For that reason alone, she should obviously not be in education. Ignore my medical issues and I get angry. When I was in high school, my doctor accidentally let slip that I'd been formally diagnosed with ADHD four years beforehand. My parents hadn't wanted me to use it as a crutch, so they just hadn't told me. I was furious and I immediately pressed to start medication and get education accommodations. My parents sort of sheepishly agreed to everything I asked for and I started doing well for the first time ever. This is all background info. Well, I've got to say off the bat, that is some of the worst parenting I've ever heard. What on earth? Anyway, we moved and I was taking a freshman science class in my sophomore year because my old school had done what was effectively the sophomore science in my freshman year. I'm the 16 year old new kid doing standardized testing with a classroom of freshmen I don't know super well. And suddenly I have to go to the bathroom. My education accommodations allowed for bathroom breaks whenever because the medication I was on at the time included fun side effects like bladder control issues. I raised my hand and I asked a substitute teacher who was acting as our test proctor while our normal science teacher was on vacation. And she laughed at me. She said she wasn't born yesterday and no amount of accommodations would convince her to let me leave the classroom during standardized testing because I might meet up with a friend who had answers to the tests or something. I tried to argue with her and I got increasingly more desperate as I explained in hushed whispers what my medication did and its side effects. She continued chuckling and shaking her head with this stupid, bemused smile. I started crying before, wouldn't you know it, I peed myself. Honestly, the next bits are a blur. 
I remember the smile slowly falling off her face and then suddenly I was in the nurse's office wearing gym clothes and listening to my parents scream at the principal in two different languages. My parents agreed not to sue if that substitute was fired. She wasn't able to get a job at another school in the area and the district apparently brought separate charges against her for ignoring accommodations. She had to pay a steep fine. Now, thankfully, some popular kids decided that anyone who made fun of me about this wouldn't be invited to the cool kid house parties. So I was only teased a little bit. I still wasn't popular in high school, but at least my parents became somewhat more supportive of me and my educational needs as a result. I hope that lady enjoys her unemployment as much as I enjoyed watching someone sign my yearbook a few years later to girl okay well at least your parents eventually did something that constituted good parenting but i hope they realized their errors in the first place of not telling you about a serious medical condition that you have that obviously is going to impact your ability to learn maybe this happened a long time ago when when things like adhd weren't as understood or accepted but if it didn't and they genuinely didn't want you to use it as a crutch and just learn to live with it i guess despite knowing the impact it can have on you or it does have on you day to day, then that is awful. But yeah, okay, maybe they've now now changed their ways. And as we can see by the end, they do care about you. I, I mean, yeah, just that first paragraph was shocking to me. Now, as for the teacher, I mean, yeah, she's just a complete write off. What a horrible woman to, to actually laugh at you while you are telling her, no, I promise you, this is not me trying to cheat or get out of the test or anything like that. Look at my docs. I mean, surely she has them on, on her system or something. Look at them. I'm on this medication because of my condition. Like, how how can somebody who's a teacher laugh at you in that spot? It's just ridiculous. It's a good thing they got rid of her. No doubt about that. It's a shame that you didn't get the money, though. As as you know, you didn't sue. And, and she was forced to pay a fine to, to I don't know, the school, the, the district, whatever, not you. I feel like you deserve some compensation for such a horrible thing. And fair play to the kids as well for, for not bullying you about this. It would be very easy to do so. I'm not saying that, that they should, but I mean, if bullies are looking for a reason to bully, that's a pretty good one. So fair play to the kids for, for not doing that. But yeah, I'm sure this moment is going to stay with you and, and be pretty traumatic for your life. And yeah, I can't imagine what what being in school and everyone knowing that you've gone through that would be like. Now for our second story. This one is brilliant. Steal my mail. Have fun thinking you're cursed. I hadn't thought of this in years until my daughter brought it up and suggested I post it here. I'm looking behind us now, across the count of time, down the long haul into history back, back in the before times, in the long, long ago. 2020. I'm talking about 2020. At the time, I was living in the Midwest and my daughter was living in the Pacific Northwest. She'd started getting into haunted dolls and when lockdown happened, she picked up customizing porcelain dolls to keep herself occupied. I sent her a few old dolls I'd found at thrift shops, but when I called her to see what she was going to do with them, she told me she never got the package. That's when she told me that porch piracy had become a huge problem in the town. She said that it had always been an issue, but since lockdown had started, they'd gotten beyond blatant. And it was an almost guaranteed chance that you wouldn't get your packages unless the mail person directly handed it to you. It got to the point that the thieves would literally follow the mail truck and would be walking up to the porch to steal packages as the male person was walking back to the sidewalk. This, as you can imagine, annoyed me on a personal level. If I was going to spend my own money sending something to my daughter for her to customize, I dang well wanted her to get it, not some random mook off the street. I told her I'd think about it and get back to her, as there was a doll I'd found that I thought would be perfect for a horror customization. Plus, I wanted to support my daughter with her art. So I wanted to commission this doll specifically. The other important factors that contributed to this situation are that I'm pagan. I love ancient fictional languages and I absolutely love being able to screw with people that deserve it. I spent a few weeks mulling the situation over in the back of my mind and I eventually hit on a solution that borrowed heavily from the satanic panic, which I'd lived through as a kid. Since I wasn't sure that she would actually get the package, I decided to send a backup doll that I'd found and planned on sending with the original doll just in case the original doll got messed up in a way that couldn't be fixed. The doll had a cracked face, was missing an eye, had a faded, stained blue silk dress, and the hair was a snarled mess. I found a shoebox that fit the doll with a little room to spare, and I got to work. 
Everything I wrote is approximated because I was an idiot and didn't take a picture before I mailed the box off. Stupid of me. Oh, that is a shame. I would have loved to see this. Anyway, first I aged some printer paper with coffee, crumpled it up until it was soft, then cut out six squarish pieces. I created two sigils and drew them on two of the pieces. One small one where the sigil took up most of the paper and one larger one where the sigil was in the center but had plenty of room around it to write other stuff. The sigils were based on the phrase F off thief and this is not yours. I also used a Galifrian translator app and created a symbol that translated into may you perpetually step on Legos barefoot in the dark. Now I believe that Galifrey is the language used in Doctor Who. The fourth and fifth pieces of paper had random symbols drawn on them, including alchemical, astrological symbols from some 70s metal albums, Led Zeppelin in specific, and random shapes that I doodled. The last one I used a Klingon translator and wrote out F U, you effing F, both phonetically and in the actual Klingon alphabet in a spiral that filled up the entire piece. I took the larger piece with the not yours sigil in the middle and wrote phrases cursing them unto the 100th generation, accused them of preferring goats as sexual partners, etc. in Norse runes, angelic script and two other languages I don't remember off the top of my head. Then I burned some of the edges and some small spots throughout the papers. God, imagine being a thief and looking at that being like, oh my God, what have I done? Once I was done with that, I rolled the largest piece into a tube, tied it with black and red ribbons, used wax to seal it, and tied it to the doll's hands over her chest with black twine. I then wrapped four of the pieces around the arms and legs of the doll, and I sealed them with wax, and stuck the last piece, the small sigil, over her face. I used a pentacle wax seal stamp to stick it to her forehead. I wrapped the doll in some ancient tissue paper that I found in my basement, and I put it in the shoebox. I added several red, black, grey and green quartz crystals as well as some pinches of dried herbs and flowers from my altar supplies. I finished the whole thing off with a short note written on torn notebook paper that essentially said that I was grateful to get this cursed thing off of my hands, that I tried to seal the evil spirit possessing the doll as best I could, but I didn't guarantee it would work and that it was the buyer's problem now. No refunds, no returns and if the buyer died, it wasn't my fault. I went absolutely cheesy 80s horror movie with the note. It was completely histrionic and overblown. I figured that anyone sensible would think that this was a prank or a prop or some I'm so dark and spooky teenager trying too hard to be dark and spooky. But mostly I wanted to make my daughter laugh or at least momentarily freak out whomever stole the box. Admittedly, I'd picked up this doll because it struck me as looking rather creepy to begin with. So all the set dressing fit the doll well. I wrapped the box in duct tape then in brown grocery bag paper, added some more random symbols on the seams, and I mailed it off to my daughter. The aftermath. She said that she got the notification that the doll had gotten delivered, but that when she went to retrieve it, nothing was there. A few hours later, she was sitting in the living room when she heard a loud thump against the door and heard the sound of a vehicle speeding off down the hill. When she opened the door, she found a ripped open and hastily retaped box containing only two things. The doll buried in what looked like two full canisters of Morton salt. She thought that was odd, but forgot to ask about the salt when she texted me to let me know the doll had actually made it. We were talking about the doll last year when she asked me why I'd sent it in salt. I asked her what she was talking about, and after she described how the doll arrived, I told her how I'd actually packaged it up. She was kind of bummed that she didn't get to see it in all its ridiculous glory, but mentioned that they haven't had a problem with porch pirates since then. So I guess the local porch pirates were so terrified of the curse that they might have unleashed on themselves that they've avoided this area since then. I genuinely thought the whole thing was so over the top and cheesy, it would be obvious it was fake. But whomever stole it the first time was so terrified that they had to drown the doll in salt to break the curse. I genuinely hope they step on Legos barefoot to this day. Well, there we go. I think that is the perfect story for this subreddit. Just absolutely genius. I'm kind of getting Mark Rober porch pirate vibes from this. But if anything, this is a level above because that, yes, it did put their face out there. And, you know, they obviously got covered in, in glitter and sparkles and stuff. But this is like genuinely people might be thinking here, these thieves, that they are cursed. And the fact that they've had to pour salt on the doll 
to try and, yeah, whatever, break the curse or whatever is ridiculous. I mean, yeah, you can scare someone or you can scare someone for the rest of their life thinking they're cursed. I think there are levels to this game. Crazy stuff. Brilliant. All I can say is it's absolutely brilliant. I feel like the only way you can level this up now even further is somehow find out who that thief was. I don't know if that's possible, but just really try. I mean, really try. Find out where they live, then go and put the doll back on their doorstep with another random note saying like, no, this is your doll now. You are cursed forever. And that will ensure that they truly are cursed, I guess, in their mind, right? Thinking about this for the rest of eternity. I, I think you just have to go that one step further if possible. Okay, now moving on to our third post from r slash traumatize them back. No, I will not be watching that. Thanks. A few years back, when I worked at a fairly large grocery store, there was this stint when the same co-worker would find me during my break and whittle away my already precious 15 minutes talking about whatever TV show she was obsessed with at the time. Now, I'm not great at watching the shows I actually want to watch, but I'm equally bad at telling people no, so often our talks would end with her insisting I watch whatever show I'd already forgotten the name of and me sheepishly answering, I'll put it on the list. Then, for like the space of a month, she got a bug up her butt about one show in particular, 13 Reasons Why. Now, most probably know what that is, but quick summary for those who lived under rocks like myself, a teenage girl uses her graphically depicted unaliving to get revenge on the people that hurt her in life. For the first time, I told her, no, not my type of show, which seemed to be her sleeper agent activation dedicated solely to making me watch this freaking show. Every day she'd bring it up and we'd have the exact same conversation. I would ask what it was again because I exercised it from my mind after the last conversation. She excitedly recounts the show and I tell her, no, still not interested in increasingly firm ways. Finally, I get tired of this game one day and I cut her off in the middle of explaining the show for the millionth time. I put on my most chipper tone and I let loose. Oh my God. You know, you love this stuff so much. I should totally tell you about how I tried to unalive myself last year. It's got all the stuff you love. Assault, unaliving, abuse that I still go to therapy for. Oh, but I didn't try to unalive myself in a cool teen drama kind of way. I just tried to step in front of a train. Oh, oh, I can tell you exactly what it feels like the moment you make the decision to end your life though. That's what you want, right? The more I went on, the paler she got. Trying to cut in since I was being loud and pretty much the whole break room could hear. She tried to apologize and act sympathetic to my pain, but I just kept going, giving more and more of the worst details until my break alarm went off. Oh, gotta get going. Thanks for the show wreck, but I don't think I'm gonna watch. Bye. Shockingly, she stopped talking to me after that, and I finally got to enjoy my breaks. Okay, don't get me wrong. I feel like if I watch a good show and there's nothing sort of massively triggering in it and I really want someone to watch it, whether it be a colleague or a friend or whatever, I will say, have you, have you started watching that yet? It's really, really good. Trust me. Have you watched it yet? Now, hopefully I wouldn't get annoying with that, but I would, I would, I would, yeah, I would keep saying it, you know, at least a couple of times just to, just to give someone a reminder if I thought they were really going to like it. Now, the difference is here with 13 Reasons Why, and I haven't watched it, I'm going to be honest, but... I do know what it's about. That is a show that you probably wouldn't push on to somebody again and again and again. And I think after hearing, no, not my type of show, when you first explain it to somebody, you then probably wouldn't do it again. Now, I'm not saying that she should have known that that you, you had this happen to you before or you were in this sort of situation, but I feel like you, you probably get some sort of hint from someone saying, no, not my type of show when it's a show about someone that has unalived themselves. Even still, like, even if it's not about them and they've had a history with this, if they just don't like that sort of stuff, then I feel like you, you back away after that one. Uh, but no, she just kept going and going and going. And the only way to stop her was saying what you said. By the way, what I'm saying is that like, if I recommended a movie to somebody and they said, oh yeah, I'll watch it, then I, would, I might ask them again in future. Oh, have you watched it, by the way? You really should if you haven't. If they said, no, I'm not going to watch that one, not my sort of movie, I would never recommend it again. That would just be weird, especially when it's a topic like this.